I thought you were walking with Gary and Yun. Ruth smiled then, and seemed as young and beautiful as when he had first met her so many years before. The cool gloom of the room disguised the little lines at the corners of her eyes, and the light streaking of silver in the dark hair drawn back from her temples and caught with a ribbon at the back of her neck. They're waiting for me, but I slipped away for a moment to make certain that you had all you wanted. She smiled down at him and then selected a cigar from the silver humidor and began to prepare it. I'll need an hour or two, he said, glancing at the pile of mail. What you really need, Sean, is an assistant. She cut the cigar carefully and he grunted. You can't trust any of these young people, and she laughed lightly as she placed the cigar between his lips. You sound as old as the prophets. She struck a vesta and waved it to clear the sulphur before she held it to the tip of the cigar. It's a sign of old age to mistrust the young. With you beside me, I'll be young forever, he told her, still awkward with a compliment after all these years, and she felt her heart swell with her love, knowing the effort it had required. She stooped quickly and kissed his cheek, and with a speed and strength that still astonished her, one of his thickly muscled arms whipped around her waist, and she was lifted into his lap. You know what happens to forward young ladies, don't you? He grinned at her, his eyes crinkling wickedly. Sean, she protested in mock horror, the servants, our guests. She struggled out of his embrace with the warmth and wetness of his kiss still on her lips, together with the tickle of his whiskers and the taste of his cigar, and rearranged her skirts and her hair. I am a fool, she shook her head sorrowfully. I always trust you. And then they smiled at each other, lost for a moment in their love. Oh, my guests, she remembered suddenly, a hand flying to her mouth. May I set the tea for four o'clock? We'll have it down at the lake. It's such a lovely day. When she had gone, Sean wasted another minute staring after her through the empty doorway into the gardens. Then he sighed again contentedly and drew the silver salver of mail towards him. He worked quickly, but with care, pencilling his instructions at the foot of each page and initialling them with a regal SC. No, but tell them politely, SC. Let me have the previous year's figures of purchase and delay the next shipment against bank guarantee, SC. Why did this come to me? Send it to Barnes, SC. Agreed, SC. To Atkinson for comment, please, SC. The subjects were as diverse as the writers. Politicians, financiers, supplicants, old friends, chances, beggars. They were all there. He flicked over a sealed envelope and stared at it for a moment, not recognising the name or the occasion. Mark Anders, Esquire, Natal Motors, West Street, Durban. It was written in the hand that was so bold and flourishing that nobody could mistake it for any other but his own, and he remembered sending the letter. Somebody had written across the envelope, Left, no forwarding address, return to sender. Sean clamped the cigar in the corner of his mouth and slit the flap with a Georgian silver paper knife. The card was embossed with the regimental crest. The Colonel-in-Chief and the officers of the Natal Mounted Rifles request the pleasure of Mark Anders, Esquire, at a regimental reunion dinner to be held at the old fort. Sean had written in the boy's name in the blank space, and at the end of the card, Do try to come, S.C. Now it was returned, and Sean scowled. As always, he was impatient and frustrated by even the slightest check in his plans. Angrily, he tossed both card and envelope into the waste paper bin, and they both missed fluttering to the carpet. Surprisingly, even to himself, his mood had altered, and though he worked on, he fumed and gruffed now over his correspondence, and his instructions became barbed. The man is a fool or a rogue or both. Under no circumstances will I recommend him to a post of such importance, despite the family connection. S.C. After another hour, he had finished, and the room was hazed with cigar smoke. He lay back in the chair and stretched voluptuously like an old lion, then glanced at the wall clock. It was five minutes short of four o'clock, and he stood up. The offending card caught his eye again, and he stooped quickly and picked it up, reading it again as he crossed the room, tapping the stiff cardboard thoughtfully on the open palm of his hand as he limped out heavily into the sunlight and across the wide lawns. The gazebo was set on a constructed island in the centre of the lake 
with a narrow causeway joining it to the lawns. Sean's household and guests were gathered there already, sitting about the table in the shade under the crazily contrived roof of the gazebo, with its intricate cast-iron work painted with carnival colours. Already a host of wild duck had gathered about the tiny island, quacking loudly for pieces of biscuit and cake. Storm Courtney saw her father coming across the lawns, and she let out one small excited squeak, leapt from the tea table and flew down the causeway to meet him before he reached the lake. He lifted her easily, as though she was still a baby, and when he kissed her, she inhaled the smell of him. It was one of the lovely smells of her existence, like the smell of rain on hot, dry earth, or horses, or the sea. He had a special perfume, like old polished leather. When he lowered her, she took his arm and pressed close to him, matching her light, quick step to his limp. How was your lunch appointment? he asked, looking down on her shining, lovely head. And she rolled her eyes and then squinted ferociously. He's a very presentable young man, Sean told her sternly. An excellent young man. Oh, Daddy, from you that means he is a weak-minded bore. Young lady, I'd like to remind you that he's a Rhodes Scholar and that his father is the Chief Justice. Oh, I know all that, but, Daddy, he just hasn't got any zing. Even Sean looked for an instant nonplussed. And what, may I ask, is zing? Zing is indefinable, she told him seriously. But you've got to zing. You've got zing. You're the zingiest man I know. And with that statement, Sean found all his fatherly advice and disapproving words gone like migrating swallows. And he grinned down at her, shaking his head. You don't really believe that I swallow all of your soft soap, do you? You'll never believe it, Daddy, but Payne Brothers have got in twelve actual Patu Couture models. They're absolutely exclusive, and Patu is all the rage now. Women in savage, barbaric colours, driven mad by those Machiavellian scheming monsters of Paris, growled Sean, and Storm giggled delightedly. You're a scream, Daddy, she told him. Irene's father has told her she may have one of them, and Mr Luchard's is a mere tradesman. Sean blinked to hear the head of one of the largest import houses in the country so described. If Charles Luchard's is a tradesman, what, pray, am I? he asked curiously. Your landed gentry, a minister of the crown, a general, a hero, and the zingiest man in the world. I see. He could not help but laugh. I see that I have a position to uphold. Ask Mr Payne to send the account to me. She hugged him again, ecstatically, and then for the first time noticed the card he still held in his hand. Oh, she exclaimed, an invitation. Not for you, my girl, he warned her. But she had taken it from his hand, and her face changed as she read the name. Suddenly she was quiet and subdued. You are sending that to that salesperson? He frowned again, his own mood altering also. I sent it. It was returned. He is left without a forwarding address. General Smuts is waiting to talk to you. With an effort she recaptured the smile and skipped beside him. Let's hurry. It's serious, old Sean. They are organised, and there is no question but that they are seeking a direct confrontation. Young Christian Smuts crumbled a biscuit between his fingers and tossed it to the ducks. They squabbled noisily, splashing in the clear water and chattering their broad, flat bills as they dipped for the scraps. How many white workers will they lay off? Sean asked. Two thousand to begin with. Smuts told him. Probably four thousand all in all. But the idea is to do it gradually, as the blacks are trained to replace them. Two thousand, Sean mused, and he could not help but imagine the wives and the children, the old mothers, the dependents. Two thousand wage earners out of work represented much suffering and misery. You like it as little as I do. The shrewd little man had read his thoughts. Not for nothing did his opponents call him Slim Yanni, or Clever Yanni. Two thousand unemployed is a serious business, he paused significantly. But we will find other employment. We need men desperately on the railways and on other projects like the Foul Hearts Irrigation Scheme. They will not earn there the way they do in the mines, Sean pointed out. No, Jan Smuts drew out the negative thoughtfully. 
But should we protect the income of 2,000 miners at the cost of closing the mines themselves? Uh, surely it's not that critical, Sean frowned quickly. The chairman of the Chamber of Mines assures me that it is, and he has shown me figures to support this view. Sean shook his head, half in incredulity and half in anguish. He had been a mine owner himself once, and he knew the problem of costs, and also the way that figures could be made to speak the language their manipulators taught. You know also, old Sean, you especially, how many others depend for life on those gold mines. It was a hard, probing statement, with a point like a stiletto. The previous year, for the first time, the sales of timber pit props from Sean's sawmills to the gold mines of the Transvaal had exceeded two million pounds sterling. The little general knew it as well as he did. How many men are employed by Natal sawmills, old Shawnee? Twenty thousand? Twenty-four thousand, Sean answered shortly. One blonde eyebrow lifted quizzically, and the Prime Minister smiled softly before going on. There are other considerations, old friend, that you and I have discussed before. On those occasions it was you who told me that to succeed in the long term our nation must become a partnership of black man and white, that our wealth must be shared according to a man's ability rather than the colour of his skin, not so? Yes, Sean agreed. It was I who said we must make haste slowly in that direction, and now it is you who hesitate and balk. I also told you that many small steps were surer than a few wild leaps made under duress, made only with an assegai at your ribs. I said, Yanni, that we should learn to bend so that we might never have to break. Yanni Smuts turned his attention back to the ducks, and they both watched them distractedly. Come on, Yanni, Sean said at last. You mentioned other reasons. Those you have given me so far are good, but not deadly urgent, and I know you are a politician enough to save the best until the end. Yanni laughed delightedly, almost a giggle, and leaned across to pat Sean's arm. <laughs> we know each other too well. We should, Sean smiled back at him. We fought each other hard enough. They both sobered at mention of those terrible days of the Civil War. And we had the same tutor, God bless him. Yes, God bless him, echoed Jan Smuts. And they remembered for a moment that colossus Louis Boerter, warrior and statesman, architect of Union and first Prime Minister of the new nation. Come, Sean insisted. What is your other reason? It is quite simple. We are about to decide who governs. The duly elected representatives of the people, or a small ruthless band of adventurers who call themselves trade union leaders, representatives of organised labour, or quite simply international communism. You put it hard. It is hard, Sean, it's very hard. I have intelligent facts that I shall lay before the first meeting of the cabinet when parliament reconvenes. However, I wanted to discuss these with you personally before that meeting. I need your support again, old Shawnee. I need you with me at that meeting. Tell me, invited Sean. Firstly, we know that they are arming with modern weapons and that they are training and organising the mine workers into war commandos. Jan Smuts spoke quickly and urgently for nearly twenty minutes, and when he had finished he looked at Sean. Well, old friend, are you behind me? Bleakly, Sean looked out into the future, seeing with pain the land he loved once more, torn by the hatred and misery of civil war. Then he sighed. Yes, he nodded heavily. I am with you, and my hand on it. You and your regiment? Jan Smuts took the big bony hand. As a minister of the government and as a soldier? Both, Sean agreed. All the way. Marion Littlejohn read Mark's letter sitting on the closed seat of the office toilet, with the door locked, but her love transcended her surroundings, discounted even the hiss and gurgle of water in the cistern suspended on its rusty downpipe above her head. She read the letter through twice, with eyes misty, and a tender smile tugging uncertainly at her lips. Then she kissed his name on the final page and carefully folded it back into its envelope opened her bodice and nestled the paper between her plump little breasts. It made a considerable lump there, when she returned to the main office, and the supervisor looked out from his glass cubicle and made a show of consulting his watch, consulting his watch, consulting his watch, consulting his watch. 
It was an acknowledged, if unwritten, rule in the registrar's office that calls of nature should be answered expeditiously, and in no circumstances should the answer occupy more than four minutes of a person's working day. The rest of the day dragged painfully for Marion, and every few minutes she touched the lump in her bodice and smiled secretively. When at last the hour of release came, she hurried down Main Street and arrived breathless, just as Miss Lucy was closing the doors of her shop. Oh, am I in time? Oh, come in, Marion, dear. How is your young man? I had a letter from him today, she announced proudly, and Miss Lucy nodded her silver curls and beamed through the silver steel frames of her spectacles. Yes, the postman told me. Ladyburg was not yet such a large town that it could not take an intimate interest in the affairs of all its sons and daughters. How is he? Marion prattled on, flushing and shiny-eyed, as she inspected once again the four sets of Irish linen sheets that Miss Lucy was holding for her. They are beautiful, dear. You can really be proud of them. You will have fine sons between them. Marion blushed again. How much do I still owe you, Miss Lucy? Uh, let's see, dear. You've paid off two pounds and sixpence. That leaves thirty shillings balance. Marion opened her purse and counted its contents carefully. Then, after a mental struggle, reached a decision and laid a shiny golden half-sovereign on the counter. That leaves only a pound, she hesitated, flushed again, then blurted out. Do you think I might take one pair with me now? I would like to begin the embroidery work. Of course, child, Miss Lucy agreed immediately. You've paid for three already. I'll open the packet. Marion and her sister Lynette sat side by side on the sofa. Each of them had begun at one side of the sheet, and their heads were bent together over it, the embroidery needles flicking in the lamplight as busily as their tongues. Mark was most interested in the articles I sent him on Mr. Dirk Courtney, and he says that he feels Mr. Courtney will have a prominent place in the book. Across the room, Lynn's husband worked, head down, over a sheath of legal documents spread on the table before him. He had lately affected a briar pipe, and it gurgled softly with each puff. His hair was brilliantined and brushed down to a polish, with a ruler-straight parting of white scalp dividing it down the middle. "'Oh, Peter!' Marion exclaimed suddenly, her hands stilling and her face lighting. "'I've just had a wonderful idea!' Peter Bortus looked up from his papers, a small frown of annoyance crinkling the serious white brow, a man interrupted at his labour by the silly chatter of women. "'You do so much work for Mr Courtney down at the bank. You've even been up to the big house, haven't you?' He even greets you on the streets. I've seen that. Peter nodded importantly, puffing at the pipe. Yes, Mr Carter has often remarked that Mr Courtney seems to like me. I think I'll be handling the account more and more in the future. Oh, darling, won't you speak to Mr Courtney and tell him that Mark is doing all this work for his book on Ladyburg and that he is ever so interested in Mr Courtney and his family? Oh, come now, Marion, Peter waved the pipe airily. You can't expect a man like Mr Courtney... You might find he is flattered to be in Mark's book. Please, dear, I know Mr Courtney will listen to you. You might find he likes the idea, and it will reflect credit on you. Peter paused thoughtfully, weighing carefully the value of impressing the women folk with his importance and influence against the dread prospect of speaking on familiar terms with Mr Dirk Courtney. The thought appalled him. Dirk Courtney terrified him and in his presence he affected a fawning, self-effacing manner, which was, he realised, part of the reason why Dirk Courtney liked to work with him. Of course, he was also a painstakingly meticulous lawyer, but the main reason was his respectful attitude. Mr Courtney liked respect from his underlings. Please, Peter, Mark is going to so much trouble over this book. We must try and help him. I was just telling Lynette that Mark has taken a month's leave from his job to go on an expedition up to Charker's Gate just to gather facts for the book. He's gone to Charker's Gate? Peter looked mystified and removed the pipe from his mouth. Well, what on earth for? There's nothing up there but wilderness. I'm not sure, admitted Marion, and then quickly. But it's important for the book. We must try and help him. Oh, what exactly do you want me to ask, Mr Courtney? Won't you ask him to meet Mark and... Sort of tell him his life story in his own words. Imagine how that would be in the book. Peter swallowed once. Marion, Mr Courtney is a busy man. He, he can't... Oh, please, Marion jumped up and crossed the room to kneel beside his chair. Pretty please, 
for my sake? Well, he mumbled, I'll mention it to him. Peter Bowes stood like a guardsman beside the head seat of the long ormolu table, bending stiffly from the waist only when it was necessary to turn the page. And here, please, Mr Courtney. The big man in the chair dashed a careless signature across the foot of the document, hardly glancing at it, and without interrupting his conversation with the other fashionably dressed men further down the table. There was a strong perfume hanging about Dirk Courtney. He wore it with the panache of a cavalry officer's cloak, and Peter tried in vain to identify it. It must be terribly expensive, but it was the smell of success, and he made a resolution to acquire a bottle of whatever it was. And here again, please, sir. He noticed now at close range how Dirk Courtney's hair was shining and cut longer at the temple, free of brilliantine, and allowed to curl into the sideburns. Peter would wash the brilliantine from his own hair tonight, he decided, and let it grow out a little longer. That is all, Mr Courtney. I'll have copies delivered tomorrow. Dirk Courtney nodded without glancing up at him, and pushing back his chair, he stood up. Well, gentlemen, he addressed the others at the table, we should not keep the ladies waiting. And they all laughed with that lustful, anticipatory laugh, their eyes gleaming like those of caged lions at feeding time. Peter had heard in detail of those parties that Dirk Courtney held out at Great Longwood, his big house. There was gaming for high stakes, sometimes dog-fighting, two matched animals in a pit, ripping each other to ribbons of dangling skin and flesh, sometimes cock-fighting, always women. Women brought in closed cars from Durban or Johannesburg, big city women, and Peter felt his body stir at the thought. Introductions to the parties were limited to men of importance or influence or wealth, and during the weekend that the revels continued, the grounds were guarded by Dirk Courtney's bully boys. Peter dreamed sometimes of being invited to one of those parties, of sitting across the green baize table from Dirk Courtney and casually drawing towards him the multicoloured pile of ivory chips without removing the expensive cigar from his lips, or of sporting among the rustling silks and smooth white limbs. He had heard of the dancers, beautiful women who disrobed as they danced the seven veils and ended mother naked while the men roared and groped. Peter roused himself almost too late, Dirk Courtney was across the room, ushering his guests ahead of him, laughing and charming, flashing white teeth from the swarthy, handsome face, a servant standing ready with his overcoat, chauffeurs waiting with the limousines in the street below, about to depart into a realm about which Peter could only speculate in disturbing, erotic detail. He hurried after him, stammering nervously. Uh, uh, Mr Courtney, um, uh, I, I have a personal request. Uh, come, Charles. Dirk Courtney did not look at Peter, but smilingly laid a friendly arm across one of his guest's shoulders. I trust you're in better luck than last time. I hate to take a friend's money. Uh, my, my wife's uh, sister has a, a fiancé, sir, Peter stumbled on desperately. He's writing a book about Lady Burke, and he would like to include an account of your personal experience. Alfred, will you ride with Charles in the first car? Dirk Courtney buttoned his coat and adjusted his hat, beginning to turn towards the door just a slight crease to his brow showing his annoyance at Peter's importunity. Uh, he's a local man. Um, Peter was almost in tears of embarrassment, but he went on doggedly. Uh, with a, a good war record, you might remember his grandfather, um, uh, John Anders. A peculiar expression came over Dirk Courtney's face, and he turned slowly to look directly at Peter for the first time. The expression struck instant terror into him. Peter had never before seen such burning malevolence, such merciless cruelty on a man's face before. It was only for an instant, and then the big man smiled, such a smile of charm and good fellowship that Peter felt dizzy with relief. A book about me? He took Peter's arm in a friendly grip above the elmo. Tell me more about this young man. I presume he is young. Oh, oh yes, sir, quite young. Uh, gentlemen... Dirk Courtney smiled apologetically at his guests. Uh, can I ask you to go ahead of me? Uh, I'll follow shortly. Your rooms are prepared, and please do not feel you have to await my arrival before sampling the uh, entertainment. Still holding Peter's arm, he led him courteously back into the huge boardroom, to a seat in one of the leather chairs by the fireplace. 
Now, young master boaters, how about a glass of brandy? And Peter watched, bemused, as he poured it with his own hands, big, strong hands, covered with fine black hair across the back, and with a diamond the size of a ripe pea on the little finger. With each step northwards, it seemed to Mark that the great bastions of Sharker's Gate changed their aspect gradually, from silhouettes smoked blue with distance until the details of the living rock came into focus. The twin buffs faced each other in almost mirror image, each towering a thousand sheer feet, but deeply divided by the gorge through which the Bubezi River spilled out onto the coastal lowlands of Zululand, and then meandered down 120 miles into a maze of swamp and lagoon and mangrove forest, before finally escaping through the narrow mouth of the tidal estuary. The mouth sucked and breathed with the tide, and the ebb blew a stain of discoloured water far out into the electric blue of the Mozambique current, a brown smear that contrasted sharply with the vivid white rind of sandy beaches that stretched for a thousand miles north and south. If a man followed the course of the Bubezi up through the portals of Chaka's Gate, as Mark and the old man had done so often before, he came out into a wide basin of land below the main escarpment. Here, among the heavy forests, the Bubezi divided into its two tributaries, the white Bubezi that dropped in a series of cataracts and falls down the escarpment of the Continental Shield, and the red Bubezi, which swung away northwards, following the line of the escarpment up through more heavy forest and open grassy glades, until at last it became the border with the Portuguese colony of Mozambique. In the flood seasons of high summer, this tributary carried down with it the eroding laterite from deposits deep in Mozambique, turning to deep bloody red. It pulsed like a living artery, and well earned its name, the Red Bubizi. Bubizi was the Zulu name for the lion, and indeed Mark had hunted and killed his first lion on its banks, half a mile below the confluence of the two tributaries. It was almost noon when at last Mark reached the river, at the point where it emerged from the gorge between the gates. He reached for his watch to check the time, and then arrested the gesture. Here time was not measured by metal hands, but by the majestic swing of the sun and the eternal round of the seasons. He dropped his pack and propped the rifle against a tree trunk. The gesture seemed symbolic. With the weight from his shoulders, the dark weight on his heart seemed to slip away also. He looked up at the rock cliffs, that filled half the sky above him, and was lost in awe, as he had been when he looked up at the arched stone latticework of the Henry the Seventh Chapel in Westminster Abbey. The columns of rock, sculptured down the ages by wind and sun and water, had that same ethereal grace, yet a freedom of line that was not dictated by the strict rules of man's vision of beauty. The cliffs were painted with lichen growth, brilliant smears of red and yellow and silvery grey. In cracks and irregularities of rock grew stunted trees, hundreds of feet above their piers. They were deformed and crippled by the contingencies of nature, as though by the careful skills of a host of Japanese bonsai gardeners, and they twisted out at impossible angles from the face of the cliff, holding out their branches as if in supplication to the sun. The rock below some narrow ledges was darkened by the stain of the urine and faeces of the hydrax, the fluffy rock rabbits which swarmed from every crack and hole in the cliff, sitting in sleepy ranks on the very edge of the drop, sunning their fat little bodies and blinking down at the tiny figure of the man in the depth of the gorge. Following the floating, wide-pinioned flight of a vulture, Mark watched it swing in steeply, planing and volleying its great brown wings to meet the eddy of the wind across the cliff face, reaching forward with its talons for a purchase as it pulled up and dropped onto its nesting ledge a 150 feet above the river folding its wings neatly, and then crouching in that grotesque, vulturine attitude with the bald, scaly head thrust forward as it waddled sideways along the rim of its huge, shaggy nest of sticks and small branches built into the rock face. 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 From this angle, Mark could not see the chicks in the nest, but clearly he recognised the heavy motions of the bird, as it began to regurgitate its crop full of rotten carrion for its young. Gradually a sense of peace settled like a mantle over Mark, and he sat down, his back against the rough bole of a fever tree. And slowly, without sense of urgency, he selected and lit a cigarette. 
drawing the smoke with an unhurried breath, and then letting it trickle out through his nostrils, watching the pale blue tendrils rise and swirl on the lazy air. He thought, perhaps, that the nearest human being was forty miles distant, the nearest white man almost a hundred, and the thought was strangely comforting. He wondered at the way in which all man's petty striving seemed insignificant in this place, in this vast primeval world. And suddenly he thought that of all men, even those who had known nothing but the crowded rat-like scrambling of the cities, could be set down in this place even for a brief space of time, then they might return to their lives cleansed and refreshed. Their subsequent strivings might become less vicious, more attuned to the eternal groundswell of nature. Suddenly he grunted, his reverie shattered by the burning needle in the soft of his neck below the ear, and he slapped at it with the open palm. The small flying insect was stunned, its carapace too tough to be crushed, even by a blow that heavy. It fell spinning and buzzing into Mark's lap, and he picked it up between thumb and forefinger, examining it curiously, for it was many years since last he had seen one of these. The tsetse fly is slightly larger than the house fly, but it has a sleeker, more streamlined body with transparent wings veined in brown. The saviour of Africa, the old man had called it once, and Mark repeated the words aloud as he crushed it between his fingers. It burst in a bright liquid red explosion of the blood it had sucked from his neck. He knew the bite would swell and turn angry red. All the subsequent bites would react in the same way, until swiftly his body rebuilt its immunity. Within a week he would not even notice their stings, and the bite would cause less discomfort than that of a mosquito. The saviour of Africa, the old man had told him. This little bastard was all that saved the whole country being overrun and overgrazed with domestic animals. Cattle first, and after cattle, the plough, and after the plough, the towns, and the railway tracks. The old man had chewed slowly, like a ruminating bull in the light of the campfire, his face shaded by the spread of his Tarai hat. One day they will find some way to kill him, or something to cure the sleeping sickness, the Nagana that he carries. Then the Africa we know will have gone, lad. He spat a long honey-brown spurt of juice into the fire. What will Africa be without its lonely places and its game? A man might as well go back and live in London town. Looking with new eyes and new understanding at the majestic indigenous forests around him, Mark saw in his imagination what it might have been like without its tiny brown-winged guardians. The forests chopped out for firewood and cleared for ox-drawn cultivation, the open land grazed short and the hooves of the cattle opening the ground cover to begin the running ulcers of erosion, the rivers browned and sullied by the bleeding earth and by man's filth. The game hunted out for its meat and because it was in direct competition to the domestic animals for grazing. For the Zulu, cattle was wealth, had been for a thousand years, and wherever cattle could thrive, they came with their herds. Yet it was ironic that this wilderness had had another guardian apart from the winged legions, and that guardian had been a Zulu. Chaka, the great Zulu king, had come here long ago. Nobody knew when, for the Zulu does not measure time as a white man does, nor record his history in the written word. The old man had told Mark the story, speaking in Zulu, which was fitting for such a story. And his old Zulu gun-bearer had listened and nodded approvingly, or grunted a correction of fact. Occasionally he spoke at length, embroidering a point in the legend. In those days they had lived here in the basin a small tribe of hunters and gatherers of wild honey. So they called themselves Inyosi, the bees. They were a poor people, but proud and they resisted the mighty king and his insatiable appetite for conquest and power. Before his swarming impies, they had withdrawn into the natural fortress of the northern bluff. Remembering the story, Mark raised his eyes and looked across the river at the sheer cliffs. Twelve hundred men and women and children. They had climbed the only narrow and dangerous path to the summit, the women carrying food upon their heads, a long, dark, moving file against the rock wall. They had gone up into their sanctuary, and from the summit the chief and his warriors had shouted their defiance at the king. Chaka had gone out alone and stood below the cliff, a tall and lithe figure, terrible in the strength of his youth and majesty of his presence. Come down, O chief, 
Receive the king's blessings and be a chief still under the sunshine of my love. The chief had smiled and called in jest to his warriors around him. Ha! Ah, I hear a baboon bark. Their laughter rang against the rock cliffs. The king turned and strode back to where his impies squatted in long, patient ranks, ten thousand strong. In the night, Chaka picked fifty men, calling each softly by name, those of great heart and fearsome reputation, and he had told them simply, When the moon is down, my children, we will climb the cliff above the river. And he laughed that low, deep laugh, the sound of which so many had heard as their last sound on this earth. For did not that wise chief call us baboons? And the baboon climbs where no man dares. The old gun-bearer had pointed out to Mark in daylight the exact route that Chaka had taken to the top. It needed binoculars to trace the hairline cracks and the finger-wide ledges. Mark shuddered now, retracing the route with his eyes, and he remembered that Chaka had led that climb without ropes in the pitch darkness after the moon and carrying his shield and his broad-bladed stabbing spear strapped on his back. Sixteen of his warriors had slipped and fallen during the climb, but such was the metal of the men that Chaka had chosen that not one of them had uttered a sound during that terrible dark plunge, not a whisper of sound, to alert the Inyosi sentries until the final soft thud of flesh on rock down below in the gorge. In the dawn, while his impies diverted the Inyosi by skirmishing on the pathway, Chaka had slipped over the rim of the cliff, regrouping his remaining warriors, and thirty-five against twelve hundred carried the summit with a single shattering charge, each stab of the great blades crashing through a body from chest to spine, and the withdrawal sucking the lifeblood in a gushing burst of scarlet. Indeed, la! I have eaten, roared the king and his men as they worked, and most of the Inyossi threw themselves from the cliff top into the river below rather than face Chaka's wrath. Those who hesitated to jump were assisted in their decision. Chaka lifted the chief of the Inyossi with both hands high above his head and held him easily as he struggled. If I am a baboon, then you are a sparrow. He roared with savage laughter. Fly, little sparrow, fly! And he hurled the man far out into the void. For once they spared not even the women nor the children. For among the sixteen Zulus who had fallen from the cliff during the climb were those whom Chaka loved. The old gun-bearer had scratched in the debris of the scree face below the cliff and showed Mark in the palms of his hand chips of old bone that might have been human. After his victory on the summit, Shaka had ordered a great hunt in the basin of the two rivers. Ten thousand warriors to drive the game, and the hunt had lasted four days. They said that the king alone, with his own hands, had slain two hundred buffalo. The sport had been such that afterwards he had made the decree... This is a royal hunting ground. No man will hunt here again. No man but the king. From the cliffs over which Shaka threw the Inyosi, east to the mountain crests, south and north for as far as a man may run in a day, and a night, and another day, this land is for the king's hunt alone. Let all men hear these words, tremble and obey. He had left one hundred men under one of his old Indunas to police the ground, under the title of Keeper of the King's Hunt, and Chaka returned again and again, perhaps drawn to this well of peace, to refresh and rest his tortured soul with its burning, crippling craving for power. He had hunted here, even in that period of dark madness, while he mourned his mother Nandi, the sweet one. He had hunted here nearly every year, until at last he had died beneath the assassin's blades, wielded by his own brothers. Probably nearly a century later, the Legislative Council of Natal, sitting in solemn conclave hundreds of miles distant from the cliffs of Chaka's Gate, had echoed his decree and proclaimed the area reserved against hunting or despoliation. But they had not policed the royal hunt as well as had old Zulu King. The poachers had been busy over the years, with bow and arrow, with snare and pit, with spear and dog pack, and with high-powered rifled weapons. Perhaps soon, as the old man had predicted, they would find a cure for the Nagana or a means of eradicating Tsetse fly. A man-made law would be repealed and the land given over 
to the lowing, slow-moving herds of cattle and to the silver-bright blade of the plough. Mark felt a physical sickness of the stomach at the prospect, and he rose and set off along the scree slope to let the sickness pass. The old man had always been a creature of habit, even to the clothes he wore and his daily rituals of living. He always camped at the same spot when he travelled a familiar road or returned to a place he had visited before. Mark went directly to the old campsite above the river junction in the elbow of the main river course, where floodwaters had cut a steep high bank and the elevated ground above it formed a plateau shaded by a grove of sycamore fig trees with stems thick as Nelson's column in Trafalgar Square and the cool green shade below them murmurous with the sound of insects and purple doves. The hearthstones for the campfire were still there, scattered a little and blackened with soot. Mark built them back into the correct shape. There was plenty of firewood, dead and fallen trees and branches, driftwood brought down by the floods and cast up on the high water mark on the bank. Mark drew clear water from the river, put the billy on to boil for tea, and then from the side pocket of the pack brought out the sheath of paper held together by a clasp and already much fingered and a little tattered that Marion had sent him. Transcript of the evidence from the coroner's inquiry into the death of John Anders Esquire of the farm Anders Land in the district of Ladyburg. Marion Little John had typed it out laboriously during her lunch hours, and her lack of skill with the machine was evident in the many erasures and overtypes. Mark had read it so many times before uh, that he could almost repeat the entire text from memory, even the irrelevant remarks from the bench. Mr. Craylung Senior, we were scamped there by the Bubezi River, Judge. Magistrate, I am not a judge, sir. The correct form of address to this court is your worship. But now he began again at the beginning, searching carefully for some small clue to what he was seeking that he might have overlooked in his previous readings. But always he came back to the same exchange. Magistrate, will the witness please refer to the deceased as the deceased and not the old man? Mr. Crayling Sr. Sorry, Your Worship, the deceased left camp early on the Monday morning. He says like he's going to look for Kudu along the ridge. It would be a little before lunchtime where he has a shot. And my boy Cornelius, he says, sounds like the old man got one. I beg your pardon. I, I mean the deceased. Magistrate. You were still in camp at that time, Mr. Crayling Sr. Yes, Your Worship, my boy and me, we was cutting and hanging bultong. We didn't go out that day. Mark could imagine the butchering of the game carcasses. The raw red meat hacked into long strips, soaked in buckets of brine, and then festooned on the branches of the trees, a scene of carnage he had witnessed so often before. When the meat had dried to black sticks, like chewing tobacco, it was packed into jute sacks, for later carriage out on the pack donkeys. The wet meat dried to a quarter of its weight, and the resulting biltong was highly prized through Africa and commanded such a high price as to make the poaching a lucrative trade. Magistrate, when did you become concerned by the deceased's absence? Mr. Crayling, well, he didn't come into camp that night, but we weren't worried like. Thought he might have been sporting up a hit one and slept up a tree. Further on in the evidence was the statement, Mr. Crayling Sr. Well, in the end, we didn't find him until the fourth day. It was the Asfuchels, uh, beg pardon, uh, the vultures, that showed us where to look. He had tried to climb the ridge at a bad place. We found where he had slipped and the gun was still under him. It must have been that shot we heard. We buried him right there. You see, he wasn't fit to carry. What with the birds and the sun? We put up a nice cross, carved it myself, and I said the Christian words. Mark refolded the transcript and slipped it back into the pack. The tea was brewing, and he sweetened it with thick condensed milk and brown sugar. Blowing on the mug to cool it, and sipping at the sweet liquid, he pondered what he had gleaned. A rocky ridge, a bad place, within sound of gunshot of where he now sat. A cairn of stones, probably, and a wooden cross, perhaps long ago consumed by termites. He had a month, but he wondered if that was time enough. On such slim directions it was a search that could take years, if luck ran against him. Even if he was successful, he wasn't yet sure what he would do next. The main concern that drove him on was merely to find where the old man lay. After that, 
he would know what to do. To do. To do. To do. He worked the ridges and the rocky ground on the south bank first. For ten days he climbed and descended the rugged rim of the basin, hard going against the grain of the natural geological formations, and at the end of that time he was lean as a greyhound, arms and face burned to the colour of a new loaf by the sun and with a dark, crisp pelt of beard covering his jaw. The legs of his pants were tattered by the coarse, razor-edged grass and by the clumps of aptly named waiterbit thorns that grabbed at him to delay his progress. There was a rich treasure of bird life in the basin. Even in the heated hush of midday, the air rang with their cries. The fluting, mournful whistle of the wood dove, or the high, piping chant of a white-headed fish eagle circling high overhead. In the early morning, and again in the cool of the evening, the bush came alive with a jewelled flash of feathers, the scarlet breast of the impossibly beautiful Narina Trogon, named long ago for a Hottentot beauty by one of the old travellers. The metallic flash of a sunbird as it hovered over the pearly, fragrant flowers of a buffalo creeper. The little speckled woodpeckers tapping furiously with heads capped in cardinal red. And in the reeds by the river, the ebony sheen of the long, floating tail feathers of the sacabula bird. All this helped to lighten the long, weary hours of Mark's search, and a hundred times a day he paused, enchanted, to watch for a few precious moments. However, of the larger animals he saw very little although their sign was there. The big shiny pellets of kudu dung scattered along their secret pathways through the forest, the dried faeces of a leopard furry with baboon hair from its kill, the huge midden of a white rhinoceros, a mountain of scattered dung accumulated over the years as the strange animal returned to the same place daily to defecate. Pausing beside the rhinoceros midden, Mark grinned as he remembered one of the old man's stories, the one that explained why the rhinoceros was so fearful of the porcupine and why he always scattered his own dung. Once, long ago, he had borrowed from the porcupine a quill to sew up the tear in his skin caused by a red-tipped mimosa thorn. When the job was done, the rhinoceros had held the quill between his teeth as he admired his handiwork. But by accident, he swallowed the quill. Now, of course, he runs away to avoid having to face the porcupine's recriminations, and he sifts each load that he drops to try and recover the missing quill. The old man had a hundred yarns like that one to delight a small boy, and Mark felt close to him again. His determination to find his grave strengthened as he shifted the rifle to his other shoulder and turned once more to the rocky ridge of the high ground. On the tenth day he was resting in the deep shade at the edge of a clearing of golden grass, when he had his first good sighting of larger game. A small herd of graceful pale brown impala, led by three impressively horned rams, emerged from the far side of a clearing. They fed cautiously. Every few seconds they froze into perfect stillness, with only the big scoop-like ears moving as they listened for danger, and their wet black noses snuffing silently. Mark was out of meat. He had eaten the last of the bully the previous day, and he had brought the rifle for just this moment to relieve a diet of mealy porridge. Yet he found himself strangely reluctant to use it now, a reluctance he had never known as a boy. For the first time, he looked with eyes that saw not just meat, but rare and unusual beauty. The three rams moved slowly across the clearing, passing a hundred paces from where Mark sat silently, and then drifted away, pale shadows into the thorn scrub. The does followed them, trotting to keep up, one with a lamb stumbling on long gawky legs at her flank, and at the rear of the troop was a half-grown doe. One of her back legs was crippled. It was withered and stunted, swinging free of the ground, and the animal was having difficulty keeping up with the herd. It had lost condition badly. Bone of rib and spine showed clearly through a hide that lacked the gloss and shine of health. Mark swung up the P-14, and the flat crack of the shot bounced from the cliffs across the river and startled a flock of white-faced duck into whistling flight off the river. Mark stooped over the doe as she lay in the grass and touched the long curled lashes that fringed the dark swimming eye. There was no reflex blink, and the check for life was routine only. He knew the shot had taken her in the centre of the heart, an instantaneous kill. Always make the check, the old man's teachings again. Percy Young would tell you that himself if he could. 
but he was sitting there on a dead lion he'd just shot, having a quiet pipe when it came to life again. That's why he isn't around to tell you himself. Mark rolled the carcass and squatted to examine the back limb. The wire noose had cut through the skin, through sinew and flesh, and had come up hard against the bone as the animal struggled to break out of the snare. Below the wire, the leg had gangrened, and the smell was nauseous, summoning a black, moving wad of flies. Mark made the shallow gutting stroke, deflecting the blade upwards to avoid puncturing the gut. The belly opened like a purse. He freed the anus and vagina with the deft surgeon strokes and lifted out bladder and bowel and gut in one scoop. He dissected the purple liver out of the mass of viscera, cut away the gallbladder and tossed it aside. Grilled over the coals, the liver would make a feast for his dinner. He cut away the rotten, stinking hind leg, and then he carefully wiped out the stomach cavity with a handful of dry grass. He cut flaps in the skin of the neck. Using the flaps of skin as handles, he hefted the whole carcass and lugged it down to the camp by the river. Cut and salted and dried, he now had meat for the rest of his stay. He hung the strips of meat high in the sycamore fig to save them from the scavengers who would surely visit the camp during his daily absences, and only when he had finished the task and he was crouching over his fire with a steaming mug in his hand did he think again of the snaring wire that had crippled the impala doe. He felt an indirect flash of anger at the person who had set that noose, and then almost immediately he wondered why he should feel particular anger at the trapper when a dozen times he had come across the old abandoned camps of white hunters. Always there were the bones and the piles of rotting, worm-riddled horns. The trapper was clearly a black man, and his need was greater than that of the others who came in to butcher and dry and sell. Thinking about it, Mark felt a despondency slowly overwhelm him. Even in the few short years since he had first visited this wilderness, the game had been reduced to but a small fraction of its original numbers. Soon it would all be gone. As the old man had said, the great emptiness is coming. Mark sat at his fireside, and he felt deeply saddened at the inevitable. No creature would ever be allowed to compete with man, and he remembered the old man again. Some say the lion, others the leopard. But believe me, my boy, when a man looks in the mirror, he sees the most dangerous and merciless killer in all of nature. The pit had been built to resemble a sunken water reservoir. It was fifty feet across and ten feet deep, perfectly circular, plastered and floored in smooth cement. Although there were water pipes installed and its position on the first slope of the escarpment above Ladyburg was perfectly chosen to provide the correct fall to the big gabled house below, yet it had never held water. The circular walls were whitewashed to gleaming purity and the floor was lightly spread with clean-washed river sand and neatly raked. Pine trees had been planted to screen the reservoir. A twelve-stranded barbed wire fence enclosed the whole plantation and there were two guards at the gate this evening Tough, silent men who checked the guests as the cars brought them up from the big house. There were forty-eight men and women in the excited, laughing stream that followed through the gate and followed the path up among the pines to where the pit was already starkly lit by the brilliant glare of the Petromax lanterns suspended on poles above it. Dirk Courtney led the revellers. He wore black gabardine riding breeches, and polished knee-length boots to protect his legs from slashing fangs. And his white linen shirt was open almost to the navel, exposing the hard, bulging muscle of his chest and the coarse black body hair which curled from the V of the neck. The sleeves of the shirt were cut full to the wrist, and he rolled a long, thin cheroot from one corner of his mouth to the other without touching it. For his arms were around the waists of the women who flanked him, young women with bold eyes, and laughing, painted mouths. The dogs heard them coming, and bayed at them, leaping against the padded bars of their cages, hysterical with excitement as they tried to reach each other through the gaps, snarling and snapping and slavering, while the handlers attempted to shout them into silence. The spectators lined the circular parapet of the pit, hanging over the edge. In the merciless light of the Petromax, the faces were laid bare, every emotion, Every stark detail of the bloodlust and sadistic anticipation was revealed. 
the hectic colouring of the women's cheeks, the feverish glitter of the men's eyes, the shrillness of their laughter, and the widely exaggerated gesturing. During the early bouts, the small, dark-haired girl beside Dirk screamed and wriggled, holding her clenched fists to her open mouth, moaning and gasping with fascinated, delighted horror. Once she turned and buried her face against Dirk's chest, pressing her body trembling and shuddering against him. Dirk laughed and held her around the waist. At the kill, she screamed with the rest of them, and her back arched. Then Dirk half lifted her as she sobbed breathlessly and supported her to the refreshment table where there was champagne in silver buckets and sandwiches of brown bread and smoked salmon. Charles came to where Dirk sat with the girl on his lap, feeding her champagne from a crystal glass, surrounded by a dozen of his sycophants, jovial and expansive, enjoying the rising sense of tension for the final bout of the evening when he would match his own dog, Chaka, against Charles's animal. I feel bad, Dirk, Charles told him. They just told me that your dog is giving almost ten pounds. That mongrel of yours will need every pound, Charles. Don't feel bad now. Keep it for later, when you'll really need it. Dirk was suddenly bored with the girl, and he pushed her casually from his lap, so that she almost lost her balance and fell. Peaked, she settled her skirts, pouted at Dirk, and when she realised he'd already forgotten her existence, she flounced away. Here, Dirk indicated the chair beside him. Do have a seat, Charles, old boy, and let's discuss your problem. The crowd drew closer around them, listening eagerly to their banter and braying slavishly at each sally. My problem is that I should like a small wager on the bout, but it does seem most unsporting to bet against a light dog like yours. Charles grinned as he mopped his streaming red face with a silk handkerchief, sweating heavily with champagne and excitement and the closeness of the humid summer evening. We all know that you make your living betting on certainties. Charles was a stockbroker from the Vitvatersrund. However, the expression of such noble sentiment does you great credit. Dirk tapped his shoulder with the hilt of his dog whip a familiar, condescending gesture that made Charles's grin tighten wolfishly. "'You will accommodate me, then?' he asked, nodding and winking at his own henchman in the press of listening men. "'At even money?' "'Of course, as much as you want. "'My dog, Kaiser, against your charker to the death. "'Even money, a wager of...' Uh, Charles paused and looked to the ladies, smoothing the crisp little moustache with its lacing of iron grey, drawing out the moment. One thousand pounds in gold. The crowd gasped and exclaimed, and some of the listeners applauded, a smattering of hand claps. No, no, Dirk Courtney held up both hands in protest. Not a thousand? And the listeners groaned, his own clack shocked and crestfallen at the loss of prestige. Oh dear, Charles murmured, too strong for your blood, huh? Well, name the wager then, old boy. Let's have some real interest. Say, uh... Ten thousand in gold, Dirk tapped Charles's shoulder again, and the man's grin froze over. The colour faded from the scarlet face, leaving it blotched purple and puffy white. The small, acquisitive eyes darted quickly around the circle of laughing, applauding faces, as if seeking an escape, and then slowly, reluctantly, returned to Dirk's face. He tried to say something, but his voice squeaked and broke like a pubescent boy. Um, and what exactly does that mean? Dirk inquired with elaborate politeness. Charles would not trust his voice again, but he nodded jerkily and tried to resurrect his cheeky grin, but it was crooked and tense and hung awkwardly on his face. Be on his face. Be on his face. Be on his face. Dirk carried the dog under his right arm, enjoying the hard, rubbery feel of the animal's compact body, carrying its fifty-pound weight easily as he dropped lightly down the steps to the floor of the pit. Every muscle in the dog's body was strained to a fine tension, and Dirk could feel the jump and flutter of nerves and sinew. Every limb was stiff and trembling, and the deep, crackling snarls kept erupting up the thick throat, shaking the whole body. He set the dog down on the raked sand, with the leash twisted securely around his left wrist, and as the dog's paws touched ground, he lunged forward, coming up short against the leash so hard that Dirk was almost pulled off his feet. "'Hey, you bastard!' he shouted, and pulled the animal back. Across the pit, Charles and his handler were bringing down Kaiser, and it needed both their strength, for he was a big dog, black as hell, and touched with tan at the eyes and chest, a legacy of the Doberman Pinscher in his breeding. 
Jaka saw him. His lunges and struggles became wilder and fiercer, and the snarl sounded like thick canvas ripping in a hurricane. The timekeeper called from the parapet, lifting his voice above the excited buzz of the watchers. Very well, gentlemen. Bait them. The two owners set them at each other with cries of Sick him up, Kaiser, and get him, boy, kill, kill, but held them double-handed on the leash, driving them into a madness of frustration and anger. On the short leash, the Doberman weaved and ducked, leggy for a fighting dog, with big shoulders dropping back to lower quarters. He had good teeth, however, and a threatening gape, enough to lock the teeth into the killer grip at the throat. He was fast, too, swinging and weaving against the leash, barking and thrusting with the long, almost snake-like neck. Chaka did not bark, but the thick barrel of his chest vibrated to the deep rolling snarls, and he stood four square on his short legs. He was heavy and low in silhouette, Staffordshire bull terrier blood carefully crossed with mastiff, and his coat was coarse and brindled gold on black. The head was short and thick, like that of a viper, and when he snarled, his upper lip lifted back in deep creases, revealing the long ivory yellow fangs and the dark pink gums. He watched the other dog with yellow leopard eyes. Bait them, bait them, bait them, yelled the crowd above, and the owners worked the leashes like jockeys pushing for the post, pointing the animals at each other and driving them on. Dirk slipped a small steel implement from his pocket and dropped on his knee beside the dog. Instantly the animals swung on him with gaping jaws, but the heavy muzzle caged his fangs. His saliva was beginning to froth, and it splattered the spotless linden of Dirk's shirt. Dirk reached behind the dog and stabbed the short spur of steel into his flesh, a shallow goading wound at the root of his testicles, just enough to break the skin and draw a drop of blood. The animal snarled on a newer, higher note, slashing sideways, and Dirk goaded him again, driving him further and further into the black fighting rage. Now at last he barked, a series of almost maniacal surges of sound from his straining throat. "'Ready to slip!' shouted Dirk struggling to manage his animal. "'Ready here!' Charles panted across the pit, his feet sliding in the sand as Kaiser reared chest high. "'Slip them!' yelled the timekeeper, and at the same instant both men slipped muzzle and leash and studded collars, leaving both animals free and unprotected. Charles turned and scrambled hurriedly out of the pit, but Dirk waited extra seconds, not wanting to miss the moment when they came together. The Doberman showed his speed across the pit, meeting Chaka in his own ground, bounding in on those long legs, leaning forward so the sloping back was flattened in his run. He went for the head, slashing open the skin below the eye in a clean sabre stroke of white teeth, but not holding. Chaka did not go for a hold either, but turned at the instant of impact, using his shoulder and the massive strength of his squat frame, he hit the bigger dog off balance, breaking his charge so that he spun away and would have gone over, but the whitewashed wall caught him and saved him, for Chaka had turned neatly to catch him as he fell. Now, however, Kaiser was up, and with a quick shift of weight he was in balance again, and he cut for the face mask, missing as the smaller brindled dog ducked, catching only the short-cropped ear and splitting it so that blood flew in black droplets to splatter the sand. Again Chaka hit with the shoulder, blood streaming from cheek to ear as he put his weight into the charge, the bigger dog reared out, declining to meet shoulder with shoulder, and as he came over he went for a hold, but the crowd screamed as they saw his mistake. "'Drop it! Drop it!' howled Charles, his face purple as an overripe plum, for his dog had got into that thick loose skin, padded with fat between the shoulder, and he growled as he worried it. "'Work him, Chaka, work him!' howled Dirk, balancing easily on the narrow parapet above them. "'Now's your chance, boy!' Locked into his grip, the Doberman was holding too high, his neck and head up and off balance. As he worried the hold, it gave and pulled like rubber, not affording purchase or leverage to throw his weight across and bring down the brindled terrier. The smaller dog seemed not even to feel the grip, although a small artery had ruptured, sending a fine spurt of blood dancing into the lantern light like a pink flamingo's feather. Drop it! screamed Charles again in agony, wringing his hands, sweat dripping from his chin. "'Belly him! Belly him!' exhorted Dirk, and his dog twisted under the big dog's chest, forcing him higher so that his front paws were off the ground, and he hit him in the belly, 
gaping wide and then plunging his yellow eye teeth full into the bare, shiny, dark skin below the ribs. The Doberman screamed and dropped his shoulder hold, twisting out violently so that Sharka's fangs tore out of his belly hold, ripping out a flap of stomach lining through which wet purple entrails bulged immediately. But he beat the terrier's try for the throat, jaw clashing into the open, snarling jaw, and teeth cracked together before they spun off and circled. Both heads were masks of blood now, eyelids blinking rapidly, the eyeballs smeared with flying blood from wound and bite, the fur of the faces plastered with black blood, blood filling the mouths and turning the exposed teeth pink, trickling from the corners of the jaw, staining the froth of saliva bright rose red. Twice more they came together, each charge initiated by the smaller, squatter Chaka, but each time the Doberman avoided the solid contact of chest to chest, for which Chaka's instincts dictated that he must keep trying. Instead, Chaka received two more slashes deeply through the brindled skin into the flesh down to white bone, so that when his next charge carried him to the wall, he left a broad, thick smear of red across the whitewash before turning to attack again. The Doberman was humped up from the belly wound, arching his back to the agony of it, but fast and lithe still, not trying for another hold since that fool's hold at the shoulder, but cutting hard and deep and keeping off his opponent like a skilled boxer. Chaka was losing too much blood now, and as he circled again, he lolled his tongue for the first time, frothy saliva discoloured with blood dripping from it, and Dirk swore aloud at this sign of weakness and imminent collapse. Big Kaiser attacked again now, cutting in sharply, as though for the throat, and then turning in a low, dark streak for another weakening flank cut. As he hit, Chaka turned into him steeply and snapped at his lean belly again, reaching low and with fortune taking a hold on the bulging entrails that showed in the open flap of the wound. Instantly the terrier went stiff on his forelegs and hunched his neck, bringing his chin down onto his chest to hold the grip. The Doberman's charge carried him on, and his entrails were pulled out of him, a long, thick, glistening ribbon in the lantern light, and the women screamed, high with anguished delight, while the men roared. Chaka crossed the bigger dog's rump now, still holding his guts, and tangled his back legs in the slippery, rubbery pink tubes that hung out of the stomach cavity, so that he stumbled off balance, and the terrier lunged forward, hitting him solidly with the chest, knocking him into the air so he dropped onto his back, screaming and kicking. Chaka's follow-up was so instinctive, so natural to his breed, that it was swift as the flash of a striking adder, and he had his killing hold, locked deep and hard into the throat, bearing down with the solid bone of his jaws, snuffling and working his head on the short hunched neck until his long eye teeth met in the Doberman's windpipe. Dirk Courtney jumped down lightly from the parapet. His laugh was pitched unnaturally high, and his face was darkened to a congested, sullen red as he whipped off his dog and turned the carcass of the Doberman with the toe of his boot. A fair kill, he laughed up at Charles, and the man glowered down at him a moment before shrugging acknowledgement of defeat and turning away. Dicky Lankham sat with the voice piece of the telephone set on the desk in front of him, and the earpiece held loosely to his cheek, trapped there by a hunched shoulder while he trimmed his fingernails with a gold-plated penknife. What can I say, old girl, except that I am desolate? But then Auntie Hortense was rich as that fellow that turned everything to gold. Yeah, that's right, Midas, or was it Croesus? I just cannot give her funeral a miss. You do understand, don't you? You don't. And he sighed dramatically as he returned the penknife to his waistcoat pocket and began to thumb through the address book for the other girl's number. No, old girl, how can you say that? Are you certain? Must have been my sister. It was almost noon on Saturday morning, and Dicky had the premises of Natal Motors to himself. He was making his domestic arrangements for the weekend on the firm's telephone account before locking up and finding some wisdom in the admonition against changing mounts in midstream. At that moment he was distracted by the crack of footsteps on the marbled floor of the showroom, and he swivelled his chair for a glimpse through the door of his cubicle. There was no mistaking the tall figure that strode through the street doors, the wide shoulders and thrusting bearded jaw, the dark glint of eyes like those of an old eagle. Oh, Lord, preserve us, 
Dicky breathed, his guilty conscience delivering a heavy jolt into his belly. General Courtney. And he let the earpiece of the telephone drop and dangle on its cord while he slid forward stealthily from his chair and crawled into shelter below his desk, knees drawn up to his chin. He could imagine exactly why General Courtney was calling. He had come to discuss the insult to his daughter in person, and Dicky Lankham had heard enough about the General's temper to want to avoid joining this discussion. Now he listened like a night animal for the stalk of the leopard, cocking his head for the sound of further footsteps and baiting his breath to a shallow, cautious trickle in order not to disclose his hiding place. The earpiece of the telephone still dangled on its cord, and now it emitted the high-pitched, distorted voice of an irate female. Without leaving the cover of the desk, he reached out to try and muffle the earpiece, but it dangled tantalising inches beyond his fingertips. "'Dicky Lankham, I know you were there!' squawked the tinny voice, and Dick wriggled forward another inch. A hand, in size not unlike that of a bull gorilla, entered Dicky's field of vision, closed on the earpiece, and placed it in Dicky's outstretched fingers. "'Please allow me,' said a deep, gravelly voice from somewhere above the desk. "'Um, uh, th th uh, thank you, sir,' whispered Dicky, trying not to draw too much attention to himself even at this stage, for want of anything better to do, he listened respectfully to the earpiece. It's, "'It's no good pretending not to be listening,' said the female voice. "'I know all about you and that blonde hussy.' "'I expect you need this,' said the deep voice from on high, and the hand passed the mouthpiece of the telephone down into his hiding place. Uh, "'Thank you, sir,' Dickie whispered again, uncertain as to which emotion dominated him at that moment, humiliation or trepidation. He cleared his throat and spoke into the telephone. Uh, uh, darling, uh, I have to go now, he croaked. I have an extremely important client in the shop. He hoped that the touch of flattery might sweeten the coming encounter. He broke the connection and crawled out unwillingly on his hands and knees. Uh, General Courtney, he dusted himself down and smoothed his hair, assembled his dignity and salesman's smile. We are honoured. I hope I did not interrupt you in anything important. Only the sapphire twinkle in the heavily browed eyes, betrayed the general's amusement. Oh, oh, but by no means, Dicky assured him. I was, um... He looked around wildly for inspiration. I was uh, merely uh, meditating. Ah, Sean Courtney nodded. Well, that explains it. Uh, uh, how how can I be of service to you, General? Dicky went on hurriedly. Don hurriedly. Don hurriedly. Don hurriedly. I wanted to find out about a young salesman of yours, Mark Anders. Dickie's heart was struck by black frost again. Uh, d d don't worry, General. I, I fired him myself, Dickie blurted out. But I tore a terrible strip off him first. You can be sure of that. He saw the General's dark, beetling brows come together and the forehead crease like an eroded desert landscape. And Dick nearly panicked. He, 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 he won't get another job in this town. Count on it, General. I've put the word out. The black mark. He's, he's probably queered around here, he is. What on earth are you talking about, man? The general rumbled like an uneasy volcano. One word from you, sir, was enough. Dickie found that the palms of his hands were cold and slippery with sweat. From me? The rumble rose to a roar, and Dickie felt like a peasant looking fearfully up the slopes of Vesuvius. What do I have to do with it? Uh, it your, your daughter, choked Dickie, after what he, he did to your daughter. My daughter? The huge voice subsided to something that was close to a whisper, but was too cold and intense. It was a fiercer sound than the roar that preceded it. He molested my daughter. Oh, God, no, General, Dickie moaned weakly. No, no, no employee of ours would raise a finger to Miss Storm. Oh, what happened? Tell me exactly. Uh, he was uh, insolent to your daughter. I thought you knew. Insolent? What did he say? He told her she did not conduct herself like a lady. She must have told you, Dickie gulped. And the general's fearsome expression melted. He looked stunned and bemused. Good God! He said that to Storm. Or what else? Uh, he told her to use the word please when giving orders. Dickie couldn't meet the man's eyes, and he lowered his head. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. There was a strangled, growling sound from the general. 
and Dicky stepped back quickly, ready to defend himself. It took him seconds to realise that the general was struggling with his mirth. Gales of laughter that shook his chest, and when at last he let it come, he threw back his head and opened his mouth wide. Weak with relief, Dicky essayed a restrained and cautious chuckle, in sympathy with the general. "'It's not funny, man!' roared Sean Courtney, and instantly Dicky scowled. Uh, "'You are much to blame. How can you condemn a man on the whim of a child?' It took Dicky a moment to realise that the child in question was the gorgeous, headstrong darling of Natal society. Uh, uh, I understood that the order came from you, stammered Dicky. From me? The laughter stopped abruptly, and the general mopped at his eyes. You thought I would smash a man because he was man enough to stand up to my daughter's tantrums? You thought that of me? Uh, yes, said Dicky miserably. And then quickly, no, no, and then hopelessly, I, I didn't know, sir. Sean Courtney took an envelope from his inside pocket and looked at it thoughtfully for a moment. Anders believed, as you did, that I was responsible for his dismissal, he asked soberly now. Yes, sir, he did. Can you contact him? Will you see him again? Dicky hesitated and then steeled himself and took a breath. I am... Um, I promised him his job back at the end of the month, after we had gone through the motions of dismissal, General. Like you, I, I didn't think the crime deserved the punishment. And Sean Courtney looked at him with a new light in his eye, and a grin lifting the corner of his mouth and one eyebrow. When you see Marg Anders again, tell him of our conversation and give him this envelope. Dicky took the envelope, and as the General turned away, he heard him mutter darkly, and now of a Mademoiselle Storm. Dicky Lankham felt a comradely pang of sympathy for that young lady. It was almost noon on a Saturday morning, and Ronald Pye sat in the back seat of the limousine, stiffly as an undertaker in his hearse, and his expression was as lugubrious. He wore a three-piece suit of dark grey cloth and a high starched collar with stiff wings. Gold-rimmed spectacles glittered on his thin beaky nose. The chauffeur swung off the main Ladyburg Road into the long straight avenue that led up to the glistening white buildings of Great Longwood on the lower slopes of the escarpment. The avenue was lined with cycads that were at least 200 years old, thick-stemmed palm-like plants, each with a golden fruit the size of hogshead, like a monstrous pine cone nestled in the centre of the graceful fronds. Dirk Courtney's gardeners had scoured the countryside for a hundred miles in each direction to find them, and had lifted them matched them for size, and replanted them here. The driveway had been smoothed and watered to keep down the dust, and parked in front of the house were twenty or thirty expensive motor cars. Wait for me, said Ronald Pye. I won't be long. And as he alighted, he glanced up at the elegant façade. It was an exact copy of the historic home of Simon van der Stel, the first governor of the Cape of Good Hope which still stood at Constantia. Dirk Courtney had his architects measure and copy faithfully every room, every arch and gable. The cost must have been forbidding. In the hall, Ronnie Pye paused and looked about him impatiently, for there was nobody to welcome him, although he had been specifically invited, perhaps summoned was a better word, for noon. The house was alive. There were women's voices, and the tinkling bells of their laughter from deep in the interior, while closer at hand the deeper growl of men punctuated by bursts of harsh laughter and voices raised to that reckless, raucous pitch induced by heavy drinking. The house smelled of perfume and cigar smoke and stale alcohol, and Ronnie Pye saw empty crystal glasses standing carelessly on the priceless rosewood hall table, leaving rings of damp on the polished surface, and an abandoned pair of pearly rose women's silk cami knickers were draped suggestively over the door handle that led to the drawing room. While he still hesitated, the door across the hall opened, and a young woman entered. She had the dazed, detached air of a sleepwalker, gliding silently into the room on neatly slippered feet. Ronnie Pye saw that she was a young girl, not much more than a child, although her cosmetics had run and smeared. Dark rings of mascara gave her a haunted, consumptive look, and her lipstick was spread so that her mouth looked like a bruised and overblown rose. Except for the slippers on her small feet, 
She was stark naked, and her breasts were immature and tender, with pale, unformed nipples, and snarled, dishevelled tresses of pale blonde hair hung onto her shoulders. Still with slow, drugged movements, she took the knickers from the door handle and stepped into them. As she pulled them to her waist, she saw Ronnie Pye standing by the main door, and she grinned at him, a lopsided, depraved, whore's smile on the smeared and inflamed lips. Another one? All right, come along then, love. She took a step in his direction, tottered suddenly, and turned away to grab at the table for support. The painted doll's face suddenly white and translucent as alabaster. Then slowly she doubled over and vomited on the thick silken expanse of woven comb carpet. With an exclamation of disgust, Ronald Pye turned away and crossed to the doors that led into the drawing room. Nobody looked up as he entered, although there were twenty people or more in the room. They were gathered intently about a solid round gaming table of ebony with ivory and mosaic inlay. The table top was scattered with poker chips, brightly coloured ivory counters, and four men sat at the table, each holding a fan of cards to his chest, watching the figure at the head of the table. The tension crackled in the room like static electricity. He was not surprised to see that one of the men at the table was his brother-in-law. He knew that Dennis Peterson regularly attended the soirees at Great Longwood, and he thought briefly of his pliant, dutiful sister, and wondered if she knew. The man has drawn us all in, Ronnie thought bitterly, glancing at Dennis and noticing his blurry, inflamed eyes, the nervous, drawn, white face. At least I have withstood this, this, this final filthy degradation. Whatever other evils he has led me into, I have kept this little shred of my self-respect. Well, gentlemen, I have bad news to impart, I'm afraid. Dirk Courtney smiled urbanely. The ladies are with me. And he spread his cards face up on the green bays. The four queens in their fanciful costume stared up with wooden expressions, and the other players peered at them for a moment, and then one at a time with expressions of disgust discarded their own hands. Dennis Peterson was the last to concede defeat, and his face was stricken. His hand shook and then with a sound that was almost a sob, he let his cards flutter from his fingers, pushed back his chair, and blundered towards the door. Halfway there, he stopped suddenly as he recognised the gaunt, forbidding figure of his brother-in-law. He stared at him for a moment, the lips still trembling, blinking his bloodshot eyes. Then he shook his head as though doubting his senses. "'You here?' "'Oh, yes,' Dirk called from the table, where he was gathering and stacking the ivory chips." Uh, did I forget to mention that I had invited Ronald? Uh, forgive me, he told the other players. I'll be back in a short while. He stood from the table, brushed away the clinging hands of one of the women, and came to take the elbows of Ronald Pye and his brother-in-law in a friendly grip, and to guide them out of the drawing-room down the long flag passage to his study. Even at midday, the room was cool and dark. Thick stone walls and heavy velvet drapes dark wooden panelling and deep Persian and Oriental carpeting, sombre, smoky-looking oil paintings on the panelling, one of which Ronald Pye knew was a Reynolds and another a Turner, heavy, chunky furniture with coverings of chocolate-coloured leather. It was a room which always depressed Ronald Pye. He always thought of it as the centre of the web in which he and his family had slowly entangled themselves. Dennis Peterson slumped into one of the leather chairs, and after a moment's hesitation, Ronald Pye took the one facing him and sat there stiffly, disapprovingly. Dirk Courtney splashed single malt whisky into the glasses that were set out on a silver tray on the corner of the big mahogany desk and made a silent offer to Ronald Pye, who shook his head primly. Instead, he carried a glass of the glowing amber liquor to Dennis, who accepted it with trembling hands, gulped a mouthful and then blurted thickly, why did you do it, Dirk? You promised that nobody would know I was here, and you invited... He glanced across at the grim countenance of his brother-in-law. Dirk chuckled. I always keep my promises just as long as it pays me to do so. He lifted his own glass. But between the three of us there should be no secrets. Let's drink to that. 
When Dirk lowered his glass, Ronald Pye asked, Why did you invite me here today? We have a number of problems to discuss, the first of which is dear Dennis here. As a poker player, he makes a fine blacksmith. How much? Ronald Pye asked quietly. Tell him, Dennis, Dirk invited him, and they waited while he studied the remaining liquor in his glass. Well, said Ronald Pye again. Don't be shy, Dennis, my old cocky diamond, Dirk encouraged him. Dennis mumbled a figure without looking up. Ronald Pye shifted his weight in the leather chair, and his mouth quivered. It's a gambling debt. We repudiate it. Shall I ask one or two of the young ladies who are my guests here to go down and give your sister a first-hand account of some of the other little tricks Dennis has been up to? Did you know that Dennis likes to have them kneel over... Dirk, you wouldn't, bleated Dennis. You're not going to do that. And he sank his face into his hands. You will have a check tomorrow, said Ronald Pye softly. Thank you, Ronnie. It really is a pleasure to do business with you. Is that all? Oh, no, Dirk grinned at him. Oh, by no means. He carried the crystal decanter across to Dennis and recharged his glass. We have another little money matter to discuss. He filled his own glass with whiskey and held it to the light. Bank business, he said. But Ronnie Pye cut in swiftly. I think you should know that I am about to retire from the bank. I have received an offer for my remaining shares. I am negotiating for a vineyard down in the Cape. I will be leaving Ladyburg and taking my family with me. No, Dirk shook his head, smiling lightly. You and I are together forever. We have a bond that's unbreakable. I want you with me always. Somebody I can trust. Perhaps the only person in the world I can trust. We share so many secrets, old friend. Including murder. They both froze at the word, and slowly colour drained from Ronald Pye's face. John Anders and his boy, Dirk reminded them, and they both broke in together. The boy got away? He's still alive? Not for much longer, Dirk assured them. My man is on the way to him now. This time there'll be no further trouble from him. You can't do it, Dennis Peterson shook his head vehemently. Why, in God's name, let it be. Ronald Pye was begging now. Suddenly all the stiffness going out of his bearing. Let the boy alone. We have enough. No, he has not left us alone, Dirk explained reasonably. He has been actively gathering information on all of us and all our activities. By a stroke of fortune I have learned where he is, and he is alone in a lonely place. They were silent now, and while he waited for them to think it out, Dirk flicked the stub of his cheroot onto the fireplace and lit another. "'What more do you want from us now?' Ronald asked at last. "'Ah, so at last we can discuss the matter in a business-like fashion.' Dirk propped himself on the edge of the desk and picked up an antique dueling pistol that he used as a paperweight. He spun it on his finger as he talked. "'I'm short of liquid funds for the expansion programme that I began five years ago. There's been a decline in sugar prices, a reduction in the bank's investment flow. But you know all this, of course.' Ronald Pye nodded cautiously. We have already agreed to adapt the land purchases to our cash flow for the next few years at least. We will be patient. I'm not a patient man, Ronnie. We are short 200,000 a year over the next three years. We have agreed to cut down, Ronald Pye went on. But Dirk was not listening. He twirled the pistol, aimed at the eye of the portrait above the fireplace, and snapped the hammer on the empty cap. Two hundred thousand a year for three years is six hundred thousands of sterling, Dirk mused aloud, and lowered the pistol, which is by chance exactly the amount paid by me to you for your shares some ten years ago. No, said Ronald Pye, with an edge of panic in his voice. That's mine, that's my personal capital. It has nothing to do with the bank. Yes, you've done very nicely with it too, Dirk congratulated him. Those crown deep shares did you proud. An excellent buy. By my latest calculations, your personal net worth is not much less than 800,000. In trust for my family, my daughter and my grandchildren, said Ronnie, his voice edged with desperation. I need that money now, 
Duck spoke reasonably. Well, what about your own personal resources? Ronald Pye demanded desperately. Stretch to their limit, my dear Ronald. All of it is invested in land and sugar. You could borrow? Oh, but why should I borrow from strangers when a dear and trusted friend will make the loan to the Ladyburg Farmers Bank? What finer security than that offered by that venerable institution? A loan, dear Ronald. Merely a loan. No, Ronald Pye came to his feet. That money is not mine. It belongs to my family. He turned to his brother-in-law. Come, I will take you home. Smiling that charming, sparkling smile, Dirk aimed the dueling pistol between Dennis Peterson's eyes. Stay where you are, Dennis, he said, and snapped the hammer again. It's all right, said Ronald Pye to Dennis. We can break away now, if you stick with me. Ronald was panting a little, and sweating like a runner. If he accuses us of murder, he accuses himself also. We can prove that we were not the planners, not the ones who gave the orders. I think he is bluffing. It's a chance we will have to take to be rid of him. He turned to face Dirk now, and there was the steel of defiance in his eyes. To be rid of this monster. Let him do his worst, and he damns himself as much as he does us. How well conceived a notion, Dirk laughed delightedly. And I do believe that you are foolish enough to mean what you say. Come, Dennis, let him do his worst. Without another glance at either of them, Ronald Pye stalked to the door. Which of your grandchildren do you cherish most, Ronnie? Natalie or Victoria? Dirk asked, still laughing. Or I imagine it's the little boy, or what's his name? Uh, damn, I should know the brat's name. I'm his godfather. He chuckled again, then snapped his fingers as he remembered. Damn me, of course. Ronald, like his granddaddy. Little Ronald. Ronald Pye had turned at the door and was staring across the room at him. Dirk grinned back at him, as though at some delicious joke. Little Ronald, he grinned, and aimed the pistol at an imaginary figure in the centre of the open carpet. A diminutive figure, it seemed, no higher than a man's knee. Goodbye, little Ronald, he murmured, and clicked the hammer. Goodbye, little Natalie, he swung the pistol to another invisible figure and snapped the action. And goodbye, little Victoria. The pistol clicked again, the metallic sound shockingly loud in the silent room. You... You... You wouldn't... Dennis's voice was strangled. You... You... You wouldn't... I need the money very badly, Dirk told him. But you... You wouldn't do that. You keep telling me what I wouldn't do. Since when have you been such a fine judge of my behaviour... Not the children, pleaded Dennis. I've done it before, Dirk pointed out. Yes, but not children. Not little children. Ronald Pye stood at the door, still. He seemed to have aged ten years in the last few seconds. His shoulders had sagged, and his face was grey and deeply lined. The flesh seemed to have fallen in around his eyes, sagging into loose folds. Before you leave, Ronnie, let me tell you a story you've been desperate to hear for twelve years. I know you have spent much time and money trying to find out already. Return to your chair, please. Listen to my story, and then you are free to go if you still want to do so. Ronald Pye's hand fell away from the door handle, and he shambled back and dropped into the leather chair as though his limbs did not belong to him. Dirk filled a spare glass with whiskey and placed it on the arm of his chair within easy reach and Ronnie did not protest. It's the story of how a 19-year-old boy made himself a million pounds in cash and used it to buy a bank. When you have heard it, I want you to ask yourself, is there anything that that boy would not do? Dirk stood up and began to pace up and down the thick carpeting between their chairs like a caged feline animal, lithe and graceful, but sinister also, and cruel and he began to speak in that soft, purring voice that wove a hypnotic web about them, and their heads swung to follow his regular measured pacing. Shall we call the boy Dirk? It's a good name, a tough name for a lad who was thrown out by a tyrannical father and set out to get the things he wanted his own way. A boy who learned quickly and was frightened of nothing. A boy who, by his nineteenth birthday, was first mate of a beaten-up old coal-burning tramp steamer running dubious cargoes to the bad spots of the Orient. 
a boy who could run a ship single-handed and whip-work out a crew of niggers with a rope end, while the skipper wallowed in gin in his cabin. He paused beside the desk, refilled his glass with whiskey, and asked his audience, Does the story grip you so far? You are drunk, said Ronald Pye. I am never drunk, Dirk contradicted him, and resumed his pacing. We will call the steamer Loisy de Nuit, the bird of the night, though in all truth it's an unlikely name for a stinking old cow of a boat. Her skipper was Le Douce, the sweet one. Again a mild misnomer, said Dirk, chuckling reminiscently and sipping at his glass. This merry crew discharged a midnight cargo in the Yellow River late in the summer of 09, and next day put into the port of Liang Su for a more legitimate return cargo of tea and silks. From the roadstead they could see that the outskirts of the town was in flames, and they could hear the crackle of small arms fire. The basin was empty of shipping, just a few sandpans and one or two small junks, and the fear-crazed population of the city was crowding the wharf, screaming for a berth to safety. Hundreds of them plunged into the basin and swam out to where the bird of night was hovering. The mate let two of them come aboard and then turned their hoses on the others, driving them off, while he learned what was happening. Dirk paused, remembering how the pressure of the solid jets of water had driven the swimmers under the filthy yellow surface of the basin, and how the others had wailed and tried to swim back. He grinned and roused himself. The communist warlord Han Wang was attacking the port and had promised the rich merchants an amusing death in the bamboo cages. Now the mate knew just how rich the merchants of Liang Su really were. After consulting the captain, the mate brought the bird of night alongside the wharf, clearing it of the peasant scum with steam hoses and a few pistol shots, and he led an armed party of Laskers into the city to the guild house where the Chinese tea merchants were gathered, paralysed with terror and already resigned to their fate. Another whiskey, Ronnie. Ronald Pye shook his head. His eyes had not left Dirk's face since the tale began. And now Dirk smiled at him. The mate set the passage money so high that only the very richest could afford to pay it. Two thousand sovereign ahead, but still ninety-six of them came aboard the bird of night, each staggering under the load of his possessions. Even the children carried their own weight, boxes and bales and sacks. And while we're on the subject of children, there were forty-eight of them in the party, all boys, of course, for no sane Chinaman would waste two thousand pounds on a girl child. The little boys ranged from babes to striplings, some of them of the age, with your little Ronald. Dirk paused to let it register, and then... It was a close run, for as the last of them came aboard, the mate cast off from the wharf, and Han Wang's bandits burst out of the city and hacked and bayoneted their way onto the wharf. Their rifle fire spattered the upper works and swept the bird of night's decks, sending her newly boarded passengers screaming down into the empty holds but she made a clear run of it out of the river and by dark was pushing out into the quiet tropical sea. Ledouce, the captain, could not believe his fortune. Almost 200,000 sovereigns in gold in four tea chests in his cabin, and he promised young Dirk a thousand for himself. But Dirk knew the value of his captain's promises. Nevertheless, he suggested a further avenue of profit. Old Ledouce had been a hard man before the drink got to him, he had run slaves out of Africa, opium out of India, but he was soft now and he was horrified by what this young mate suggested. He blasphemed by praying to God and he wept. Le pauvre petit, he slobbered and poured gin down his throat until after midnight he collapsed into that stupor that Dirk knew would last for 48 hours. The mate went up onto the bridge and sounded the ship's siren, shouting to his passengers that there was a, a government gunboat overtaking them and driving them from the open deck back into the holds. They went like sheep, clutching their possessions. The mate and his laskers battened down the hatches, closing them up tight and solid. Can you guess the rest of it? he asked. A guinea for the correct solution. Ronald Pye licked his dry grey lips and shook his head. No? Dirk teased him. The easiest guinea you ever missed. Why, it was simple. The mate opened the seacocks and flooded the holds. He watched them curiously, anticipating their reactions. Neither of his listeners could speak. And as Dirk went on, there was a small change in his telling of it. 
He no longer spoke in the third person. Now it was we and I. Of course we couldn't flood to the top. Even in that low sea she might have foundered and rolled on her back. There must have been a small airspace under the hatch, and they held the children up there. I could hear them through the four-inch timbers of the hatch. For almost half an hour they kept up there howling and screaming until the air went bad and the roll and slosh of the water got them. And when at last it was all over and we opened the hatches, we found that they had torn the woodwork of the underside of the covers with their fingers, ripped and splintered it like a cage full of monkeys. Dirk turned to the empty chair nearest the fireplace and sank into it. He swilled the whiskey in his right hand and then swallowed it. He threw the crystal glass into the empty fireplace and it exploded into diamond fragments. They were all silent, staring at the glass splinters. Why? whispered Dennis huskily at last. In God's name, why did you kill them? Dirk did not look at him. He was lost in the past, reliving a high tide in his life. Then he roused himself and went on. We pumped out the hold, and I had the Laskers carry all the sodden sacks and bales and boxes up into the saloon. God, Ronnie, you should have been there. It was a sight to drive a man like you mad with greed. I piled it all up on the saloon table. It was a treasure that had taken fifty cunning men a lifetime to accumulate. There was gold in coin and bar, diamonds like the end of your thumb, rubies to choke a camel, emeralds. Well, the merchants of Liangsu were some of the richest in China. Together with the passage money, the loot came to just over a million in sterling. And the captain, La Douce, his share? Ronald Pye asked. Even in his horror, his accountant's mind was working. Oh, the captain! Dirk shook his head and smiled that light boyish smile. Oh, poor La Douce! He must have fallen overboard that night, drunk as he was. He would not have been able to swim. And the sharks were bad out there in the China Sea. God knows that the water was full of dead Chinese. There was enough to attract them. No, there was only one share not counting a token to the Laskers. Two hundred pounds for each of them was a fortune beyond their wildest dreams of avarice. That left a million pounds for a night's work, a million before the age of twenty. That is the most terrible story I have ever heard. Ronald Pye's voice shook like the hand that raised the glass to his lips. I remember it when next you have naughty thoughts of leaving Ladyburg. Dirk counselled him and leaned across to pat his shoulder. We are comrades. Unto death, he said. For Mark Anders, the allotted days were running out swiftly. Soon he must leave the valley and return to the world of men, and a quiet desperation came over him. He had searched the south bank and the steep ground above it, now he crossed to the north bank and started there all over again. Here, for the first time, he had warning that he was not the only human being in the valley. The first day he came across a line of snares laid along the game trails that led down to the drinking places on the river. The wire used was the same as that he had found on the gangrened leg of the crippled Impala Doe, eighteen-gauge galvanised mild steel wire, probably cut from some unsuspecting farmer's fence. Mark found sixteen snares that day and tore each out, bundled the wire and hurled it into one of the deeper pools of the river. Two days later he came across a log dead for, so cunningly devised and so skilfully set that it had crushed a full-grown otter. Mark used a branch to lever the log clear and drew out the carcass. He stroked the soft, lustrous chocolate fur and felt again the stirring of his anger. Quite unreasonably, he was developing a strange proprietary feeling for the animals of this valley, and a growing hatred for anyone who hunted or molested them. Now his attention was divided almost equally between his search for his grandfather's grave and for further signs of the illegal trapper. Yet it was almost another week before he had direct sign of the mysterious hunter. He was crossing the river each morning in the dawn to work the north bank, it might have been easier to abandon the camp under the fig trees, but sentiment kept him there. 
It was the old man's camp, their old camp together, and in any case he enjoyed the daily crossing and the journey through the swamp land formed in the crotch of the two rivers. Although it was only the very edge of this watery world that he moved through, yet he recognised it as the very heart of this wilderness, an endless well of precious water and even more precious life, the last secure refuge of so many creatures of the valley. He found daily evidence of the big game on the muddy paths through the towering stands of reed and papyrus, which closed overhead to form a cool, gloomy tunnel of living green stems. There were Cape Buffalo, and twice he heard them crashing away through the papyrus without a glimpse of them. There were hippopotamus and crocodile, but they spent the days deep in the dark reed-fringed lakelets and mysterious lily-covered pools. At night he often woke and huddled in his blanket to listen to their harsh grunting bellows resounding through the swampland. One noonday, sitting on a low promontory of rocky wooded ground that thrust into the swamp, he watched a white rhinoceros bring its calf out of the sheltering reeds to feed on the edge of the bush. She was a huge old female, her pale grey hide scarred and scratched, folded and wrinkled over the massive prehistoric body that weighed at least four tons, and she fussed over the calf anxiously, guiding it with her long, slightly curved nosed horn. The calf was hornless and fat as a piglet. Watching the pair, Mark realised suddenly how deeply this place had touched his life, and the possessive love he was developing for it was reaffirmed. Here he lived as though he was the first man in all the earth, and it touched some deep atavistic need in his spirit. It was on that same day that he came upon recent signs of the other human presence beyond Charka's gate. He was following one of the faint game paths that skirted another ridge, one of those that joined the main run of ground into the slopes of the escarpment when he came upon the spoor. It was barefooted, the flat-arched and broad soles of feet that had never been constricted by leather footwear. Mark went down on his knees to examine it carefully. Too big for a woman, he knew at once. The stride told him the man was tall, the gait was slightly toe-in, and the weight was carried on the ball of the foot, the way an athlete walks. There was no scuff or drag of toe on the forward swing. A high lift and a controlled transfer of weight a strong, quick, alert man, moving fast and silently. The spoil was so fresh that at the damp patch where the man had paused to urinate, the butterflies still fluttered in a brilliant cloud for the moisture and salt. Mark was very close behind him, and he felt the hunter's thrill, as without hesitation he picked up and started to run the spoor. He was closing quickly. The man he was following was unaware. He had paused to cut a green twig from a wild loquat branch, probably to use as a toothpick, and the shavings were still wet and bleeding. Then there was the place where the man had paused, turned back on his own spore a single pace, paused again, almost certainly to listen, then turned abruptly off the path. Within ten more paces the spore ended, as though the man had launched into flight, or been lifted into the sky by a fiery chariot. His disappearance was almost magical, and though Mark worked for another hour casting and circling, he found no further sign. He sat down and lit a cigarette, and found he was sweaty and disgruntled. Although he had used all his bushcraft to come up with his quarry, he had been made to look like an infant. The man had become aware of Mark following, probably from a thousand yards off, and he had jinked and covered his spoor, throwing the pursuit with such casual ease that it was a positive insult. As he sat, Mark felt his ill-humour harden and become positive hard anger. Yeah, I'll get you yet, he promised the mysterious stranger aloud. And it did not even occur to him what he might do if he ever did come up with his quarry. All that he knew was that he had been challenged, and he had taken up the challenge. The man had the cunning of... Mark sought for a simile, a properly disparaging simile, and then grinned as he found a suitable one. The man had the cunning of a jackal, but he was Zulu, so Mark used the Zulu word, Pungoshi. I'll be watching for you, Pungoshi. I'll catch you yet, little jackal. His mood improved with the insult, and as he crushed out his cigarette, he found himself anticipating the contest of bush skills between himself and Pungoshi. 
Now, whenever Mark moved through the wilderness, part of his attention was alert for the familiar footprints in the soft, earthy places, or for the glimpse of movement and the figure of a man among trees. Three times more he cut the spoor, but each time it was cold and wind-eroded, not worth following. The days passed in majestic circle of sky and mountain, of sun and river and swamp, so that time seemed without end until he counted on his fingers and realised that his month was almost run. Then he felt the dread of leaving, a sinking of the spirits such as a child feels when the moment of return to school comes at the end of an idyllic summer holiday. That night he returned to the camp below the fig tree with the last of the light and set his rifle against the stem of the tree. He stood a moment, stretching aching muscles and savouring the coming pleasure of hot coffee and a cheerful fire, when suddenly he stooped and then dropped on one knee to examine the earth, soft and fluffy with leaf mould. Even in the bad light there was no mistaking the print, broad bare feet. Quickly Mark looked up and searched the darkening bush about him, feeling an uneasy chill at the knowledge that he might be observed at this very moment. Satisfied at last that he was alone, he backtracked the spoor and found that the mysterious stranger had searched his camp, had found the pack in the tree and examined its contents, then returned them carefully, each item to its exact place, and replaced the pack in the tree. Had Mark not seen the spoor in the earth, he would never have suspected that his pack had been touched. It left him disquieted and ill at ease to know that the man he had tracked and followed had been tracking and probably watching him just as carefully, and with considerably greater success rewarding his efforts. Mark slept badly that night, troubled by weird dreams in which he followed a dark figure that tap-tapped with a staff on the rocky, dangerous path ahead of him, drawing slowly away from Mark without looking back, while Mark tried desperately to call him to wait but no sound came from his straining throat. In the morning he slept late, and rose dull and heavy-headed to look up into a sky filled with slowly moving, cumbersome ranges of dark, bruised, cumulus cloud that rolled in on the southeast wind from off the ocean. He knew soon it would rain, and that he should be going. His time had run, but in the end he promised himself a few last days, for the old man's sake and his own. It rained that morning before noon, a mere taste of what was to come, but still a quick cold grey drenching downpour that caught Mark without shelter. Even though the sun poured through a gap in the clouds immediately afterwards, Mark found that the cold of the rain seemed to have penetrated his bones, and he shivered like a man with palsy in his sodden clothing. Only when the shivering persisted long after his clothes had dried did Mark realise that it was exactly twenty-two days since his first night under the fig tree and his first exposure to the river mosquitoes. Another violent shivering fit caught him, and he realised that his life probably depended now on the bottle of quinine tablets in the pack high in the branches of the fig tree and on whether he could reach it before the malaria struck with all its malignance. It was four miles back to the camp, and he took a short route through thick thorn and over a rocky ridge to intersect the path again on the far side. By the time he cut the path, he was feeling dizzy and light-headed, and he had to rest a moment. The cigarette he lit tasted bitter and stale, and as he ground the stub under his heel, he saw the other spore in the path. In this place, it had been protected from the short downpour of rain by the dense spread branches of a mahubahuba tree, it overlaid his own outward spoor, moving in the same direction as he had. But the thing that shocked him was that the feet that had followed his had been booted and shod with hobnails. They were the narrower, elongated feet of a white man. There seemed in that moment of sickness on the threshold of malaria to be something monstrously sinister in those booted tracks. Another quick fit of shivering caught Mark and then passed, leaving him momentarily clear-headed and with the illusion of strength, but when he stood to go, his legs were still leaden. He had gone another five hundred yards back towards the river when a day-flighting owl called on the ridge behind him at the point where he had just crossed. Mark stopped abruptly and tilted his head to listen. 
A tsetse fly bite at the back of his neck began to itch furiously, but he stood completely still as he listened. The call of the owl was answered by a mate. The fluting hoot-hoot, skilfully imitated, but without the natural resonance. The second call had come from out on Mark's right, and a new chill that was not malaria rippled up his spine as he remembered the hooting owls on the escarpment above Ladyburg on that night so many months ago. He began to hurry now, dragging his heavy, almost disembodied legs along the winding path. He found that he was panting before he had gone another hundred yards, and that waves of physical nausea flowed upwards from the pit of his belly, gagging in his throat as the fever tightened its grip on him. His vision began to break up, starring and cracking, like shattered mosaic work, irregular patches of darkness edged in bright iridescent colours, with occasional flashes of true vision, as though he looked out through gaps in the mosaic. He struggled on desperately, expecting at any moment now to feel the spongy swamp grass under his feet and to enter the dark protective tunnels of papyrus which he knew so well, and which would screen him and direct him back to the old camp. An owl hooted again, much closer this time, and from a completely unexpected direction. Confused and now frightened, Mark sank down at the base of a knobthorn tree to rest and gather his reserves. His heart was pounding against his ribs, and the nausea was so powerful as almost to force him to retch. But he rode it for a moment longer, and miraculously his vision opened as though a dark curtain had been drawn aside, and he realised immediately that in his fever blindness he had lost the path. He had no idea where he was now, or the direction in which he was facing. Desperately, he tried to relate the angle of the sun, or slope of the ground, or find some recognisable landmark, but the branches of the knob thorn spread overhead, and all around him the bush closed in, limiting his vision to about fifty paces. He dragged himself to his feet and turned up the rocky slope, hoping to reach high ground, and behind him an owl hooted, a mournful funereal sound. He was blind and shaking again when he fell, and he knew he had torn his shin, for he could feel the slow warm trickle of blood down his ankle, but it seemed unrelated to his present circumstances, and when he lifted his hand to his face, it was shaking so violently that he could not wipe the icy sweat from his eyes. From his eyes. From his eyes. From his eyes. Out on his left the owl called again, and his teeth chattered in his head, so that the sound was magnified painfully in his ears. Mark rolled over and peered blindly in the direction of the hooting owl, trying to force back the darkness, blinking the sweat that stung like salt in his eyes. It was like looking down a long, dark tunnel to light at the end, or through the wrong end of the telescope. Something moved on a field of golden-brown grass, and he tried to force his eyes to serve him, but his vision wavered and burned. There was movement, that was all he was sure of. Then silent meteors of light, yellow and red and green, exploded across his mind and cleared, and suddenly his vision was stark and brilliant and he could see with unnatural, almost terrifying clarity. A man was crossing his flank. A big man, with a head round and heavy as a cannonball. He had a restless shoulders and a thick bovine neck. Mark could not see his face. It was turned away from him, yet there was something dreadfully familiar about him. He wore a bandolier over his shoulder, over the khaki shirt, with military-style button-down pockets, and his breeches were tucked into scuffed brown riding boots. He carried a rifle at high port across his chest, and he moved with a hunter's cautious, exaggerated tread. Mark's vision began to spin and disintegrate it again. He blundered to his feet, dragging himself up the stem of the knob thorn, and one of the sharp, curved thorns stabbed deeply into the ball of his thumb. The pain was irrelevant, and he began to run. Behind him there was a shout, the view halloo of the hunter, and Mark's instinct of survival was just strong enough to direct his feet. He swung away abruptly, changing direction, and he heard the bullet a split second before the sound of the shot. It cracked in the air beside his head like a gigantic bullwhip, and after it the secondary brittle snapping bark of the shot. Mauser, he thought, and was transported instantly to another time in another land. 
Some time-keeping instinct in his head began counting the split instants of combat, tolling them off even in his blindness and sickness, so that without looking back he knew when his hunter had reloaded and taken his next aim. Mark jinked again in his stumbling, unseeing run, and again the shot cracked the air beside him, and Mark unslung the P-14 from his shoulder and ran on. Suddenly he was into trees, and beside him a slab of bark exploded from a trunk, torn loose by the next Mauser bullet, in a spray of flying fragments and sap, leaving a white wet wound in the tree. But Mark had reached the ridge, and the instant he dropped over it, he turned at right angles, doubled up from the waist and dogged away, seeking desperately in the gloom for a secure stance from which to defend himself. Suddenly he was deafened by a sound as though the heavens had cracked open and the sun had fallen upon him. Sound and light so immense and close that he thought for an instant that a mouser bullet had shattered his brain. He dropped instinctively to his knees. It was only in the silence that followed that he realised lightning had struck the iron stone ridge close beside him, and the electric stench of it filled the air around him. The rumbling echo of thunder still muttered over the blue wall of the escarpment, and the huge bruised masses of cloud had tumbled down out of the endless blue vault of the sky to press close against the earth. The wind came immediately, cold and swiftly rushing, thrashing the branches of the trees above him, and when Mark dragged himself to his feet again, it billowed his shirt and ruffled his hair, inducing another fit of violent shivering. It seemed the sweat on his face had been turned instantly to hoarfrost. In the rush of the wind, an owl hooted somewhere close at hand, and it began to rain again. In the rain, ahead of Mark, there was the gaunt, tortured shape of a dead tree. To his fever-distorted eyes, it had the shape of an angry warlock, with threatening arms and twisted frame, but it offered a stance, the best he could hope for at this exposed moment. For a few blessed moments, the darkness behind his eyes lightened, and his vision opened to a limited grey circle. He realised that he had doubled back and come up against the river. The dead tree against which he stood was on the very brink of the sheer high bank. The river had undercut its roots, killing it, and in time would suck it into the flood and carry it away downstream. At Mark's back the river was already high and swift, and brown with rainwater, cutting off any retreat. He was cornered against the bank while the hunters closed in on him. He knew there was more than one. The owl calls had been signals, just as they had on the escarpment of Ladyburg. Mark realised that perhaps his only hope was to separate them and lead them unsuspecting on to his stance. But it must be quick before the fever tightened its hold on his sense. He cupped one hand to his mouth and imitated the sad, mournful call of the scops owl. Then he leaned back against the tree and held the rifle low across one hip. Off on the right, his call was answered. Mark did not move. He stood frozen against the tree trunk, and his eyes swivelled to the sound, and his forehead creased in his effort to see clearly. Long minutes drew out, and then the owl hoot came, even closer at hand. The rain came now on the wind, driving in at a steep angle, ice-white lances of slanting rain, tearing at the bush and open grassland beneath it, hammering into Mark's face with sharp needles that stung his eyelids, and yet cleared his vision again, so that he could see into the swirling white veils of water. Carefully Mark cupped his mouth and hooted the owl call, bringing his man closer. "'Where are you?' a voice called softly. "'Rene, where are you?' Mark swivelled his eyes to the sound. A human figure loomed out of the sodden trees, half obscured by the sheets of falling rain. "'I heard your shots. Did you get him?' He was coming towards Mark, a tall, lean man with a very dark brown sun-scorched face, deeply lined and wrinkled around the eyes, with a short, scraggy growth of grizzled hair covering his jowls. He carried a Lee Metford rifle at the trail in one hand, and a rubber ex-army gas cape draped over his shoulders, wet and shiny with rain. A man passed the prime of his life, with the dull, unintelligent eyes and the coarse, almost brutal features of a Russian peasant. The face of one who would kill a man with as little compunction as he would slit a hog's throat. He had seen Mark against the dead tree trunk, 
but the swirling rain and the bad light showed him just the dark, uncertain shape, and the call of the owl had lulled him. Rene, he called again, and then stopped, for the first time uncertain, and he squinted into the teeming rain with those flat, expressionless eyes. Then he swore angrily and tried to bring up the Lee Metford, swinging it across his belly and wiping the safety catch across with one calloused hand. It's him, he recognised Mark, and the dismay was clear to see on his face. No, Mark warned him urgently, but the rifle barrel was coming up swiftly, and Mark had heard the metallic snick of the safety catch and knew that in an instant the man would shoot him down. He fired with the P-14 still held low across his hip. The man was that close, and the shot crashed out with shocking loudness. The man was lifted off his feet, thrown backwards with the Lee Metford spinning from his hands, hitting the rocky ground with his shoulder blades, his heels kicking and drumming wildly on the earth, and his eyelids fluttering like the wings of the trapped butterfly. The blood that streamed from his chest soaked into the sodden material of his shirt and was diluted immediately to a paler rose pink by the hammering raindrops. With a final spasm, which arched his back, the man subsided and lay completely still. He seemed to have shrunk in size, looking old and frail, and his lower jaw hung open, revealing the pink rubber gums of a set of tobacco-stained false teeth. The rain beat into the open, staring eyes, and Mark felt a familiar sense of dismay, the cold, familiar guilt of having inflicted death on another human being. He had an irrational desire to go to the man, to give him succour, though he was far past any human help, to try to explain to him, to justify himself. The impulse was fever-born and carried on wings of rising delirium. He was at the point now where there was no clear dividing line between fantasy and reality. You shouldn't have, he blurted. You shouldn't have tried. I warned you. I warned. He stepped out from the shelter of the dead tree trunk, forgetting the other man. The man that his senses should have warned him was the most dangerous of the two hunters. He stood over the man he had killed, swaying on his feet, holding the rifle at high port across his chest. Hobday had missed with his first three shots, but the range had been two hundred or more, and it was uphill shooting, with intervening bush and tree and scrub, snap shooting at a running, jinking target, worse than jump shooting for kudu in thick cat bush, a slim, swift human shape. He had fired the second and third shots in despair, hoping for a lucky hit before his quarry reached the crest of the ridge and disappeared. Now he could follow only cautiously, for he had seen the rifle strapped on the boy's back, and he might be lying up on the ridge, waiting his chance for a clear shot. He used all the cover there was, and at last the sheets of falling rain, to reach the rocky crest, at any moment expecting retaliatory fire, for he had shown his own hand clearly. He knew the boy was a trained soldier. He was dangerous, and Hobday moved with care. His relief when he reached the crest was immense, and he lay there on his belly in the wet grass, with the reloaded Mauser in front, peering down the reverse slope for a sign of his quarry. He heard the owl hoot out on his left and frowned irritably. Stupid old bastard, he grunted, pissing himself with fright still. His partner needed constant reassurance his old nerves too frayed for this work, and he used no judgment in timing his contact calls, the damn fool. He must have heard the shots and known the critical stage of the hunt was on, yet here he was calling again like a child whistling in the dark for courage. He brushed the man from his thoughts and concentrated on searching the rain-swept slope until he froze with disbelief. The owl call had been answered from his left, just below the crest. Hobday came up on his feet, crouching low. He worked swiftly along the crest. He saw solid movement in the grey, wind-whipped scrub and dropped into a marksman's squat, drawing swift aim on the indistinct target, blinking the rain out of his eyes, waiting for a clean shot and then grunting with disappointment as he recognised his own partner, bowed under the glistening wet gas cape, moving heavily as a pregnant woman in the gloom beneath the rain cloud and dense overhead branches. The man paused to cup his hand over his mouth and call the mournful owl hoot again, and the bearded hunter grinned. Decoy duck, he whispered aloud, the stupid old dog. And he felt no compunction 
that he was going to let his ally draw fire for him. He watched him carefully, keeping well down on the skyline, the silhouette of his head and shoulders broken by the low bush under which he crouched. The old man in the gas cape called again, and then waited, listening, with his head cocked. The reply called him on, and he hurried forward into the wind and the rain, drawn on to his fate. Hobday grinned as he watched. One share was better than two, he thought, and wiped the clinging raindrops of the rear sight of the Mauser with his thumb. Suddenly the old man checked and began to swing up the rifle he carried, but the shot crashed out and he went down abruptly in the grass. Hobday swore softly, bitterly. He had missed the moment, had not been able to place the spot from which the shot had been fired. Now he waited with a finger on the trigger, screwing up his eyes again against the rain. Less certain of himself, feeling a new awe and respect for his quarry, and the first tingle of fear. It had been a good kill, that one, leading the old man right in close, calling him up as though he were a hungry leopard coming to the bleat of a diker horn. Then suddenly the bearded hunter's doubts were dispelled, and for an instant he could hardly believe his fortune. Just when he had been stealing himself for a dangerous and long-drawn-out duel, his quarry stepped out into the open from the cover of a twisted dead tree trunk on the bank of the river, a childlike, ridiculously artless act, an almost suicidal act, so ingenuous that for a moment he feared some trap. The young man stood for a moment over the corpse of the man he had killed. Even at this range, it seemed as though he swayed on his feet, his face very pale in the weak grey light, but the car key of his shirt standing out clearly, against the backlighting from the surface of the river. It needed no fancy shooting. The range was less than 150 yards, and for an instant Hobday held his aim in the centre of the boy's chest. Then he squeezed off the shot with exaggerated care, knowing that it was a heart shot. As the rifle pounded back into his shoulder, and the brittle crack of the Mauser stung his eardrums, he watched the boy hurled backwards by the shock of the strike, and heard the bullet impact with a jarring solid thud. Mark never heard the Mauser shot, for the bullet came ahead of the sound. There was only the massive shock in the upper part of his body, and then he was hurled backwards with a violence that drove the air from his lungs. The earth opened behind him, and as he fell there was the sensation of being engulfed in a swirling vortex of blackness, and he knew for just a fleeting moment of time that he was dead. Then the icy plunge into the swirling brown current of the river caught him and shocked him back from the edge of blackness. The water engulfed his head, and he had the strength to kick away from the muddy bottom. As his head broke the surface, he dragged precious air into his crushed burning lungs, and realised that he held the P-14 in both hands still. 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 The wooden stock of the rifle was directly in front of his eyes, and he saw where the Mauser bullet had smashed into the wood and then flattened against the solid steel of the breech block. The bullet was squashed to a misshapen lump, like a pellet of wet clay hurled against a brick wall. The rifle had stopped it dead, but the tremendous energy of impact had driven the P-14 into his chest, expelled the air from both lungs and hurled him backwards over the bank. With enormous relief, Mark let the rifle drop into the muddy bottom below him and was swept away by the current into a swirling nightmare of malaria and rain and raging brown water. Slowly the darkness overwhelmed him and his last conscious thought was the irony of being saved from death by the rifle shot to be immediately drowned like an unwanted kitten. The water came up over his mouth again. He felt it burn in his lungs and then he was gone into nothingness. There can be few terrors like those of a mind tortured by malaria fever, a mind trapped in an endless nightmare from which there is no escape, never experiencing the relief of waking in the sweat of terror and knowing it was only delirium. The nightmares of malaria are beyond the creation of the healthy brain. They are unremitting and they are compounded by a consuming thirst. The thirst, as the body burns its strength and fluid in the heat of the conflict, a cycle of attack no less terrible for its regular familiar stages. Icy chills that begin the cycle, followed by burning Saharan fevers that rocket the body heat to temperatures so high that they can damage the brain, and that are followed by the great sweat, 
when body fluid streams from every pore of the victim's body, desiccating him and leaving him without the strength to lift head or hand while he awaits the next round of the cycle to begin, the next bout of icy, shivering chill. There were semi-lucid moments for Mark between the periods of heat and cold and nameless terror. Once, when the thirst burned so that every cell of his body shrieked for moisture and his mouth was dry and swollen, it seemed that strong, cool hands lifted his head and bitter liquid, bitter but cold and wonderful, flooded his mouth and ran like honey down his throat. At other times, in the cold, he pulled his own grey woollen blanket close around his shoulders and the smell of it was familiar and well-beloved the smell of wood smoke and cigarette, and his own body smell. Often he heard the rain and crash rumble of thunder, but always he was dry, and then all sound faded, and he was swept away on the next cycle of the fever. He knew it was seventy-two hours after the first chilling onslaught that he came once again fully conscious. The malaria is that predictable in its cycle that he knew when it was to within a few hours. It was late afternoon, and Mark lay wrapped in his blanket on a mattress of fresh-cut grass and aromatic leaves. It was still raining, a steady, grey, relentless downpouring from the low, pregnant cloud banks that seemed to press against the treetops. But Mark was dry. Above him was a low roof of rock, a roof that had been blackened over the millennium by the wood fires of others who had sought shelter in this shallow cave. The opening of the shelter faced northwest away from the prevailing rain-bearing winds, and just catching the last glimmerings of light from where the sun was sinking behind the thick cloud cover. Mark lifted himself with enormous effort onto one elbow and looked about him, bemused. Propped against the rock wall near his head was his pack. He stared at it for a long time, puzzled and completely bewildered. His last coherent memory had been of engulfing icy waters. Closer at hand was a round-bellied beer pot of dark fire-baked clay, and he reached for it immediately, his hands shaking not only from weakness but from the driving need of his thirst. The liquid was bitter and medicinal, tasting of herbs and sulphur, but he drank it with panting, grateful gulps until his belly bulged and ached. He lowered the pot then and discovered beside it a bowl of stiff, cold maize porridge, salted and flavoured with some wild herb that tasted like sage. He ate half of it and then fell asleep, but this time into a deep, healing sleep. When he awoke again, the rain had stopped, and the sun was near its zenith, burning down through the gaps and soaring valleys of the towering cloud ranges. It required an effort, but Mark rose and staggered to the opening of the rock shelter. He looked down into the flooded bed of the Bubezi River, a roaring red-brown torrent in which huge trees swirled and tumbled on their way to the sea, their bared roots lifted like the crooked, arthritic fingers of dying beggars. Mark peered to the north and realised that the whole basin of swamp and bush had been flooded. The papyrus beds were submerged completely under a dull silver sheet of water that dazzled like a vast mirror. Even the big trees on the lower ground were covered to their upper branches and the higher ridges of ground and the low copies were islands in the watery waste. Mark was still too weak to stay long on his feet, and he staggered back to his bed of cut grass. Before he slept again, he pondered the attack, and the disquieting problem of how the assassins had known that he was here at Charker's Gate. Somehow it was all bound up with Andersland, and the death of the old man in the wilderness here. He was still pondering it all when sleep overtook him. When he awoke it was morning again, and during the night somebody had replenished the beer pot with the bitter liquid and the food bowl with stiff porridge and a few fragments of some roast flesh that tasted like chicken, but was probably iguana lizard. The waters had fallen dramatically. The papyrus beds were visible with their long stems flattened and the fluffy heads wadded down by the flood. And the trees were exposed, the lower ground drying out. The Bubezi River in the deep gorge below Mark's shelter had regained some semblance of sanity. Mark was suddenly aware of his own nudity and of the stink of fever and body wastes that clung to him. He went down to the water's edge, a long, slow journey during which he had to pause often to regain his strength and for the dizziness to stop singing in his ears. He bathed away the smell and the filth and examined the dark purple bruise where the Mauser bullet had smashed the P-14 into his chest. 
Then he dried in the fierce glare of the noon sun. It warmed the last chills of the fever from his body, and he climbed back up to the shelter with a spring and lightness in his step. In the morning he found that the beer pot and food bowl had disappeared, and he sensed somehow that the gesture was deliberate, and carried the message that as far as his mysterious benefactor was concerned, he was able to fend for himself again, and that he had begun to outlive his welcome. Mark gathered his possessions, finding that all his clothing had been dried out and stuffed into the canvas pack. His bandolier of ammunition was there also, and the bone-handled hunting knife was in its sheath, but his food supply was down to one can of baked beans. He opened it and ate half, saved the rest for his dinner, left the pack in the back of the shelter and set out for the far side of the basin. It took him almost two hours to find the killing ground, and he recognised it at last only by the dead tree with its twisted arthritic limbs. The ground here was lower than he had imagined, and had been swept by the flood waters. The grass was flattened against the earth, as though brilliantined and combed down. Some of the weaker trees had been uprooted and swept away, and in the lower branches of the larger, stronger trees, the flood debris clung to mark the high water level. Mark searched for some evidence of the fight, but there was none. No body nor abandoned rifle. It was as though it had never been. Mark began to doubt his own memory, until he slipped his hand into the front of his shirt and fingered the tender bruising. He searched down the track of the waters, following the direction of the swept grass for half a mile. When he saw vultures sitting in the trees and squabbling noisily in the scrub, he hurried forward, but it was only a rhino calf, too young to have swum against the flood, drowned and already beginning to putrefy. Mark walked back to the dead tree and sat down to smoke the last cigarette in his tin, relishing every draw, stubbing it out half-finished and carefully returning the butt to the flat tin with its picture of the black cat and the trademark Craven A. He was about to stand when something sparkled in the sunlight at his feet, and he dug it out of the stool damp earth with his finger. It was a brass cartridge case, and when he sniffed it, there was still the faint trace of burned cordite. Stamped into the base was the lettering Mauser Fabriken, 9 mm and he turned it thoughtfully between his fingers. The correct thing was to report the whole affair to the nearest police station, but twice already he had learned the folly of calling attention to himself while some remorseless enemy hunted him from cover. Mark stood up and went down the gentle slope to the edge of the swamp pools. A moment longer he examined the brass cartridge case, then he hurled it far out into the black water. At the rock shelter he hefted his pack onto his shoulders, bouncing from the knees to settle the straps. Then, as he crossed to the entrance, he saw the footprints in the fine, cold ash dust of the fire. Broad, barefooted, he recognised them instantly. On an impulse, he slipped the sheathed hunting knife off his belt and laid it carefully exposed in an offertory position at the base of the shelter wall. Then, with a stub of charcoal from the dead fire, he traced two ancient symbols on the rock above it. The symbols that old David had told him stood for the bowed slave who bears gifts. He hoped Pungoshe, the poacher, would come again to the rock shelter and that he would interpret the symbols and accept the gift. On the slope of the south butt of Charka's gate, Mark paused again and looked back into the great sweep of wilderness and he spoke aloud softly because he knew that if the old man were listening, he would hear, no matter how low the voice. All he had learned and experienced here had hardened his resolve to come to the truth and to unravel the mystery and answer the questions that still hid the facts of the old man's death. I'll come again some day. Then he turned away towards the south, lengthening his stride and swinging into the gate, just short of a trot that the Zulus call Minza Amchlabati or eat the earth greedily. The suit felt unfamiliar and confining on his body, and the starched collar was like a slave's ring about Mark's throat, the pavement hard and unyielding to his tread, and the clank of the trams and the honk and growl and clash of train and automobile were almost deafening after the great silences of the bush, 
and yet there was excitement and stimulation in the hurrying tide of human beings that swirled about him, strident and colourful and alive. The tropical hothouse of Durban town encouraged all growth of life, and the diversity of human beings that thronged her streets never failed to intrigue Mark. The Hindu women in their shimmering saris of gaudy silk, with jewels in their pierced nostrils and golden sandals on their feet. The Zulus, moon-faced and tall, their wives with the conical ochre headdresses of mud and plaited hair that they wore for a lifetime, bare-breasted under their cloaks, big stately breasts, fruitful and full as those of the Earth Mother, to which their infants clung like fat little leeches, and the short leather aprons high on their strong, glossy, dark thighs, swinging as they walked. The men in loincloths, muscled and dignified, or wearing the cast-off rags of Western clothing, with the same jaunty panache and self-conscious assurance that the mayor wore his robes of office. The white women, remote and cool and unhurried, followed by a servant as they shopped, or encapsuled in their speeding vehicles. Their men in dark suits and the starched collars better suited to the climes of their native north, many of them yellowed with fever and fat with rich foods as they hurried about their affairs, their faces set in that small perpetual frown, each creating for himself an isolation of the spirit in the press of human bodies. It was strange to be back in the city. Half of Mark's soul hated it, while the other half welcomed it, and he hurried to find the human company for which he had sometimes hungered these long weeks just past. "'Good God, my dear old sport!' Dickie Lankham, with a red carnation in his buttonhole, hurried to meet him across the showroom floor. "'I'm delighted to have you back. I was expecting you weeks ago. Business has been deadly slow. The girls have been ugly, tiresome and uncooperative. The weather absolutely frightful. You've missed nothing, old son, absolutely nothing.' He held Mark off at arm's length and surveyed him with a fond and brotherly eye. "'My God, you look as though you've been on the Riviera, brown as a pork sausage, but not as fat.' God, I do declare you've lost weight again. And he patted his own waistcoat, which was straining its buttons around the growing bulge of his belly. I must go on a diet. Which reminds me, lunchtime. You will be my guest, old boy. I insist. I absolutely insist. Dicky began his diet with a plate piled high with steaming rice, coloured to light gold and flavoured with saffron. Over this was poured rich, chunky mutton curry, redolent, with Hindu herbs and garnished with mango chutney, ground coconuts, grated Bombay duck and half a dozen other sauces, and as the turbaned Indian waiter offered him the silver tray of salads, he loaded his side plate enthusiastically without interrupting his questioning. God, I envy you, old boy. Often promised myself that. One man against the wilderness. Pioneer stuff, hunting and fishing for the pot. He waved the waiter away and lifted a quart stein of lager beer to salute Mark. Cheers, old boy. Tell me all about it. Dicky was silent at last, although he did the curry full justice while Mark told him about it, about the beauty and the solitude, about the bush-felt dawn and the starry, silent nights. And he sighed occasionally and shook his head wistfully. Wish I could do it, old boy. You could, Mark pointed out, and Dicky looked startled. It's out there now. It won't go away. It won't go away. It won't go away. It won't go away. 